call the roll. Here. Present. Good morning, I'm here. 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 Thank you. Our invitation today will be delivered by Pastor Mike Sellers from the First Baptist Church in Mansfield. Thank you so much for coming out today. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledges. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for the day before us. And we're grateful for the journey that we have in life. And we're grateful that uh, we have a God who can walk with us, who does walk with us, and guides our steps. And today we come before you asking for your blessings on the proceedings of today. For Judge Whitley, the commissioners, and all in decision-making today, Father, we are asking you to guide them with wisdom and with uh, clarity and understanding and the ability, Father, to look through everything and make decisions, God, that will bring glory to you, Father, but then also to benefit those that are part of this county and this city, God. So today we ask you to watch these proceedings with your watch care and blessing and ministering in the lives of those who are apart. And Father, we want to bring glory to you in, in all of our actions. So God, today we thank you that we can call upon you to be our strength. So today we thank you. We bring glory to your name. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Reverend. <coughs> Manius? <coughs> Members of the court, we have several items as it relates to the agenda this morning. <clears throat> but before we get started, uh, just a quick announcement. This coming Friday at 10 o'clock, we will be celebrating our law enforcement memorial. And so everyone is invited to that. It's at 10 o'clock this coming Friday, and it'll be on the west side of the historic courthouse. As it relates to the agenda itself, we're going to take several items out of order this morning. Um, when we get to the proclamations, resolutions, and presentations, we're going to go ahead and move up item F, which is the 2021 United Way campaign kickoff. That'll be the first item that we'll be um, uh, talking about and during that particular section of the agenda. Also, members of the court, as we get right, as soon as we get into the administrator section, we're going to move to the briefing agenda. And we're going to first have um, uh, a discussion and uh, public input session as it relates to the redistricting of Tarrant County Commissioner's Precincts. Uh, Mr. Bob Heath with with Bickerstaff Heath is here and that will be talking a little bit about that. Uh, when we get to, and as soon as we finish with that, then we'll be going into our section, which will be dealing initially with um, health-related issues, uh, the coronavirus, and, and Mr. Tanasia will be making his presentations at that time. We do have a presentation and under briefing from IEM. This is the interim report. I believe that you all have received a copy of that. Um, um, we're going to hold that until after lunch today. Uh, it, the court may run a little bit long, so we'll take a lunch break. And then finally, as it relates to the briefing, we had item number D, which is the rules of order. This was something the court had suggested that we put on the agenda today. I'm going to ask that we hold that particular item uh, there's still a lot of work that we're doing at staff level on that, and we do not have a complete uh, document or even a draft document to share with you yet. So if we can indulge the court in allowing us a little more time to do that, we would appreciate it. Also, members of court, <clears throat> under the purchasing department, item K5, 
This is RFP 2021-146. We do have a revised court communication as it relates to that particular item also. So there's a lot of changes on the agenda, but I think that we'll have a large agenda today, but I believe that we'll be able to manage through that uh, in the order that we, we discussed. Thank you. GK, I do have one thing. Um, under your section on consent regarding the agreements for the election transportation? Yes. On the agenda itself, it says October 18 through 19. Um, I think that's supposed to be the 29th. It looks like everything within that item has the correct dates, but I just wanted to point that out in case it makes a difference. Very good. And I know that the documents that we have for the ratification have the correct dates on there. Thank you. Okay. Um, and court members, you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of September the 28th. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Please vote. Uh, Commissioner Brooks, Commissioner Fickus. Yes. Motion and Commissioner Johnson, you heard the yes, so motion passes unanimously. Um, okay, we're going to start off, and as Mr. Maney has just indicated, we're going to begin with the United Way. Um, recognition, and I think that uh, Susan, you're going to come forward and for Susan. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. We are kicking it off today. A little bit different, but that's okay. We're getting used to different, and that's all good. Different change, change is good, isn't it? Change is good. And um, this morning, we do have some special guests from United Way with us, and I'd like to invite them up. Faye Lou, she, um, she is our United Way rep, if you want to come up. And um, we also have um, Brian Colthorpe. He is the 2021 United Way campaign chair. And I think Brian's going to say a few words with us this morning. And um, we have a video that um, you did for us that will just kick it all off. And I'll let you talk a little bit about some of the, the fun things that are happening with the court and um, what we have going on today. Go from there. Yes, sir. Thank right you. Uh -huh. Ryan, Thank you. come on forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us today. So the, the mission of United Way of Tarrant County is to provide leadership and harness resources to solve Tarrant County's toughest social challenges. So to me, that's what these campaigns are all about, our fundraising campaign. It's us, right, to provide the leadership uh, that we need to support those, so to solve those toughest social challenges here in uh, Tarrant County. So us all together to provide the leadership, and we really appreciate y'all's leadership and all of the Tarrant County employees to harness our resources to put that pot together so that we can do what we do at United Way of Tarrant County. So on behalf of everyone at uh, United Way of Tarrant County, we appreciate the county, uh, Judge Whitley, all the commissioners and all the employees uh, to do that for us. And thank you for having us today. You bet. Thank you, Brian. I do think we have a video to run at this time. Hi, this is Tarrant County Judge Glenn Whitley, and it's time to kick off our annual United Way campaign. Uh, as I have said before, I am a great fan of the United Way. I think they do tremendous work in our community. The 2021 theme is opportunity for all of Tarrant County. Uh, they really help all facets of our community, the veterans, the senior citizens, children, families. They just do great work. And what we're asking our employees to do is to consider making voluntary donations to the United Way. They have, as I said, many agencies that they work with and that will be listed on their page. But you also have the opportunity to designate that your contributions go to any charity that you would like for them to go to. Uh, for the second time, we're going to make available to our employees the ability to do this through an e-portal. And the way you get access to that is you would go to the Tarrant County webpage, 
go down near the bottom and click on the employee portal then click on the loop and that will open up a, a logo you'll see for United Way and you click on that and that'll take you into the portal that will allow you to make your designations and your voluntary contributions. We always do a lot of things around this United Way uh, campaign. We have auctions, departments will sell tamales, uh, so we have all different types of campaigns going on, many different ways that you can participate. Last year, one of the, the things that I said, and I'm going to say it again this year, if the county raises over $100,000, I'll shave my head, or, or I'll let some of the, the folks who've given the larger contributions come in and participate in shaving my head. We are also going to have the same competition that we've had in years past with the city of Fort Worth. We have beaten them all of the years with the exception of that first year. You know, we want to keep this going, so I'm really dependent upon y'all to make whatever contributions you can. Um, and again, I hope you will go to the ePortal. We will have a few um, cards or just forms if you want to fill those out, but certainly the easiest way will to take your iPhone or your computer or your iPad Go to the ePortal and complete the contribution. The campaign opens up on October the 19th, so I encourage all of y'all to uh, begin thinking about this. You have to go back in, even if you contributed last year, you have to go back in and re-enter your contribution for this next year. So please think about it. Be prepared. October the 19th, go to the, uh, the ePortal and make your contribution to the United Way. Again, it's a great organization. Thank you very much for all that you do for Tarrant County. So we are gonna have the auction again this year. You know, we've got folks that do the tamale sales. We'll be selling, I'm sure, chili, and we'll be selling all kinds of stuff down in the uh, lobby of the administration building from time to time. But in the past where we've had um, events at the sub courthouses, each commissioner was doing that. Last year we went to an auction and it was very successful. We've got over 100 items in that auction this year. Uh, it ranges from tickets to the Colonial. Uh, we have also tickets to the Rodeo. Um, there are um, Maverick tickets. There's a lot of individual stuff that have been either produced or made by folks within the county. We have a bourbon whiskey set. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, we also have a bottle of Eagle Rare that is uh, very rare uh, that will be in there. And, you know, that's again opening up today, right? And so I want to encourage everyone. Like I said, we have over 100 items. And um, it, it's an opportunity to again, raise some money for, uh, for the United Way. Um, it is a great organization. They do, gr they do do great work. And we should be very thankful that we have an organization like this that looks out and helps and partners with many of our community agencies. So um, thank you all for being here. We're, uh, we're gonna beat Fort Worth again this year, even though we've got a new leader um, you know, I, I think I can drum Maddie like I've drummed Betsy. Uh, for Dana, all the Dana has you in her side. Yeah, I know. She was a little upset at not winning last year for Betsy's last. It was close. It was close. So we really need to step up, folks. I do not want to lose. Uh, you know, I got, I got two campaigns left. Don't let me down. And if you'd like to shave my head so that I'll look like some of the people out here in the audience, uh, then you can do that, and uh, all we have to do is get over $100,000. So uh, let's get after it, and let's make, a, let's make it successful again this year. Thank you all for coming out here today. Thank you, Court. Thank you. Thank you. Next is um, a proclamation. Uh, Commissioner Brooks, I believe that you have today. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a cause that is central to the way we do business in Tarrant County. And it is domestic violence 
Awareness Month. <clears throat> I'll read this proclamation into the record with your sufferance, Judge Whitley. Whereas the mission of the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence is to develop a comprehensive and effective community effort to reduce family violence and, and domestic violence homicides in Tarrant County. And whereas the Texas Council on Family Violence reported a 23% increase in homicides between 2019 and 2020, in which 228 Texans were killed in 68 Texas counties by intimate partners. And whereas domestic violence programs, professionals, and advocates of nonviolence have joined together with the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence to provide the citizens of Tarrant County and the state of Texas with information on domestic <coughs> violence. And whereas Domestic Violence Awareness Month allows citizens to learn more about preventing domestic violence and support organizations who provide critical advocacy, services and assistance to victims. And whereas one in every three women and one in every four men will experience domestic violence during their lifetime. Domestic violence violates an individual's privacy, dignity, and security due to the systematic use of physical, emotional, sexual, psychological, and economic control and or abuse. And whereas the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County endorses the mission of the Tarrant Council, the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence, and the Intimate Partner Violence Felony, Felony Prosecution Team of the Tarrant County Criminal <coughs> District Attorney's Office to end the tragic cycle of violence and eliminate the Intimate Partner Violence epidemic from our community. Now therefore be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim the month of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Tarrant <coughs> County and urge all citizens to actively participate in programs working towards the elimination <coughs> of domestic violence. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set our hands and caused the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 19th day of October, 2021. And your honor, I move approval of this proclamation. Second. We have a motion of second. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Present to accept this proclamation on the on behalf of the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence is Ms. Stephanie Thompson. Why are you looking around, Stephanie? <laughs> And uh, Sharon Wilson and Elena Bangs on behalf of the Tarrant County Criminal <coughs> District Attorney's Office. I wasn't supposed to call Stephanie up here, but since she's here and she is very much involved in the Tarrant County Council, uh, 
it's one of my prerogatives to do so. <laughs> Thank you, Court. We're going to get Stephanie up here regardless. My name is Michelle Morgan, Chair of the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence and Vice President at One Safe Place. Um, this could not happen without Stephanie um, and Rachel um, on your staff, uh, Judge Whitley. Um, those numbers that you first read are staggering. Uh, the pandemic was not our friend to victims of domestic violence this last year. Um, we are going, the council is going to have a remembrance event uh, for those that did um, lose their lives um, in 2020. We're going to host that on October 28th via Zoom um, at 3 o'clock. It will be posted on the One Safe Place Facebook and website. Um, it is open to anyone in the community that would like to join us. Um, we will also have a survivor um, that is speaking. Um, as challenging as last year was, um, we have a lot of great things to celebrate in Tarrant County. What we do know is that victims are far more safer when they reach out to services. And we have such a great partnership and network of agencies here in Tarrant County. And I'm super proud to be a part of all of the agencies that are doing great work to address this horrible pandemic, uh, this horrible isolation that we see um, with domestic violence. Um, but who is leading that charge um, is our district attorney's office, um, and more specifically, that intimate partner violence unit. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, District Attorney Sharon Wilson and Elena Banks. Good morning, members of the court. Thank you very much for having us today. As always, as I come before you guys, I'd like to thank you so much for all what you've given us and our ability to have this intimate partner violence team. For several years, we've come before you and shown you the numbers and how we've reduced homicides in this county by half time and time again. And just as Michelle mentioned, uh, last year's numbers were staggering. Uh, the statistics that you were given, 21 of those homicides, primary and secondary victims, including three unborn babies, were murdered in this county um, as a part or as a result of intimate partner violence. Um, but just like Michelle said, uh, we are so fortunate in this county that we have worked so hard for so many years to build partnerships with our law enforcement and our courts and our, um, our advocacy agencies so that we could stop down in the middle of last year and we could pivot and figure out what we could do. And you know, because we've won an award from the Texas Association of Counties and a national award for the program that we put together to address this at intake, um, we have evaluated over 3,000 cases that have come in since that time. Um, it is not a good number because I would like the number to be zero, but this year, as we sit here in October, we have only had six homicides. And so we were able to get down to the grassroots level with all of the people that we work with on a daily basis to try and see what we could do to curb what was happening. And I think that we've made really good steps and progress in that. So again, I want to thank you very much. And I think Sharon has a couple of things to say. I just want to thank you because it was because you all believed and saw the problem and were willing to work with us and fund our efforts that we've been able to make the big difference that we have in Tarrant County. And Tarrant County is light years away from other counties and how they're handling this issue. And it's because of you all. Thank you very much. Let me apologize to Michelle for completely misreading <laughs> your email on how things were supposed to go today. It's totally fine. <laughs> That's why she looked at the top. Thank you, Rachel, for coming up. All right, let's get this done. Y'all have a round. Commissioner Allen, I believe you have some certificates of appreciation to present. I do. Um, well, I am so honored to have an amazing group of community leaders that have joined me this morning um, in person to be recognized. I appreciate them taking the time 
Um, our relationship, my relationship with many of these folks goes back um, for several years um, prior to my serving in elected office. Um, and it wasn't until COVID hit that um, there's this great idea to bring this particular group of leaders together to help to provide advisement, not just to me, but to our public health department and to others about how we can best serve our growing, burgeoning Latino community here in Tarrant County. And, you know, it's so interesting because as a person of color, oftentimes my ideas can be minimized. And even if they're not minimized, they'll be co-opted and the credit is never given to me or to other people of color. Um, and I did not want to be guilty of doing that because for the past well over a year, I think about a year and a half, um, these group of Latino leaders who wear many hats, who live in both Tarrant and Dallas County, who um, serve in so many different capacities, they have been participating in regular conversations about what we are doing here at the county, what's working, and more importantly, what's not working. Um, so we have only met via Zoom. We were meeting, I think, every other week uh, last year for months and months, and then we started to meet once a month, um, but throughout that time, this group of leaders have been so committed and so dedicated to providing their perspective, in some ways very unique, um, and how we can do a better job to serve our very diverse county. And so while they are Latinos and they're Latino leaders, their expertise, advice, and counsel serve not just the Latino community, but the greater community. Um, and I have to give a personal shout out and thanks to Amanda Arizola, who serves on our JPS Board of Managers. Um, she and I were thinking, okay, what more can we do to make sure that we are doing the outreach and also receiving the input that we need? And so uh, we worked on this idea together and I wanna thank my staff for continuing this effort um, for over a year and a half. So. Amanda, please come up and say a few words about the importance of the work that this group has done, and then I will recognize each Latino leader individually. Good morning, thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner Allen, for the recognition of the work of the Latino Leaders Advisory Group. When, as stated previously in the beginning of the pandemic, we had to realize and know that unfortunately our communities of color would be disproportionately affected by any different type of outreach services as we've seen across the country. And this is where this idea of bringing together community that is unique in being able to have have a non-English speaking component, but also to be culturally competent, and especially in how we're able to outreach individuals coming through. So thank you, Commissioner Allen, for having that forethought to be able to bring this group together. This group together identified pitfalls in some of the outreach strategies, like single-use email services for our older communities, where we know that families together create their own registrations, and typically one person is in, is uh, in charge of that, and being only able to use a unique email was not one of the best strategies to be able to get our registration vaccine rollout. That was one of the main things that the group was able to identify. Additionally, being able to register in Spanish, however, receiving a text message in English, again, is another place where this group was able to help Tarrant County Public Health and being able to meet with Dr. Tejeda and being able to identify and quickly resolve those things. So we really, really appreciate all of the work and the ideas of all all of the people that we gathered, which were restaurateurs, citizens, school board members, uh, all our advocates, as well as our hospital health care workers. And so we want to be able to thank them for their time. The importance of that and moving forward is that not only within this pandemic, we still have additional areas of concern that go through that make our local government great. Because as Latinos, estamos aquí, nos, nos vemos. Um, and so we want to make sure that everybody is seen and everybody is heard. Um, not and and particularly, but thank you again, Commissioner Allen. Thank you to all of the amazing individuals that have taken their time to be here. Great, thank you. very good. I'm going to join you down there now.
from Pat Amanda Arizona. Uh, Fernando Benavides. Jesse Herrera. Y'all might want to come into the well here. And I... Juan Daniel Garcia. Lisa Padilla. <coughs> Ruth Villalonga. Christina Elvazar. Norma Garcia Lopez. And not present, but who was very involved is Mauricio Perez, Olga Hickman, and Sandra Garcia. And I'd like to move to receive and file those certificates. Second. We have a motion to second to receive and file. Uh, please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Commissioner Johnson has a couple of proclamations. And um, if it's all right, I will go ahead and uh, read those into the record. Commissioner Johnson? Yes, it's my honor to sponsor the proclamation for National 4-H Week. I've been involved in 4-H work for over 70 years. I enjoy what these kids do. It's amazing. And it's my privilege to be a sponsor of this proclamation. And I believe that we have, uh, and y'all come on forward now, Courtney Davis, who is uh, AgriLife from Texas AgriLife Extension. Uh, Brittany Mayer, who is the new Tarrant County Horticultural Agent. Uh, Caitlin Lavender, who is the 4-H Youth Council President. <coughs> Kylie Lavender, who is the 4-H Council Secretary. And Valerie Morrow, who is the Tarrant County 4-H Youth Council Reporter. So, uh, welcome, and I'll read this into the record. Whereas the Tarrant County Commissioner Court is proud to honor the 4-H Youth <laughs> Development Program of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service for 114 years of providing... Were you there originally when that started out? <laughs> uh, it feels like it, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> providing experience-based education to youth throughout the Lone Star State. And whereas this admirable program provides learning and growing experiences for the whole child, including head, heart, hands, and health, and helps young Texans to acquire knowledge, develop life skills, and form attitudes to enable them to become a self-directed, productive, and contributing <coughs> member of our society. And whereas a vital component of the program is youth adult partnerships provided through hundreds of adult volunteers who generously dedicate their time, talents, and resources to the youth in Tarrant County. And whereas Tarrant County 4-H serves over 440 youth through long-term, year-round programming and community clubs and an additional 2,000 who participate in short-term activities and events, and whereas throughout the proud history, the 4-H program has developed positive role models for countless Texans and through its innovative and inspiring programs, continues to build character, character and to instill the values that have made our state strong and great. 
Now therefore be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim October 3rd through 9th, 2021 as National 4-H Week in Tarrant County and commend the 4-H Youth Development Program of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the many volunteer men and women who have made the program a success in witness whereof we are here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 19th day of October 2021. I move for its approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Oops. Almost gave you all the pharmacists. <laughs> speech, right? You got it in your back pocket? You're ready to go? All right. It's all yours. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as he said, my name is Caitlin Lavender, and I am the current president of the Tarrant County 4-H Youth Council. On behalf of Tarrant County 4-H, I would like to thank the Commissioner's Court for the constant support you give to our programs. 4-H has taught me leadership, public speaking skills, record keeping practices, and how to follow through on a project. I strive to follow our motto and show it in my life, to make the best better. There are thousands of kids across America who share this sentiment, and I thank you for acknowledging 4-H in Tarrant County. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much. I just want to take one minute to just recognize these kids and the program. Um, they. 2020, 2019 kind of threw us for a loop with 4-H. We couldn't be in schools. Um, we couldn't meet face to face with our kids and yet our volunteers stepped up and our youth stepped up and we saw a slight dip in the program, but they have come back with a vengeance and they are here to stay. Um, I think that a lot of people don't realize that 4-H is still alive and well in their community. We're more than just cows and chickens. We do robotics, we do public speaking, we do foods and nutrition. So we are building the leaders for Tarrant County, the future leaders for Tarrant County, and I'm super proud of the youth that we have here in Tarrant County. They're a force to be reckoned with. Well, thank you all very much. We do very much appreciate uh, the efforts that y'all put forth, the, the volunteers. Uh, that uh, young men and women that put forth. Uh, Commissioner Johnson um, has been a passionate champion yep. of the 4-H program for, I'm sure, he said 70 years. And that just means that he actually started as one of y'all. We have and a picture in the office of him with <laughs> as a 4 h Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> We didn't know you had pictures. Well, just one, but we, we'll, we'll bring it out. We, we'll you might have out. to bring that picture up here. We might we have will. to have a picture of that. We will. But it, it is, uh, he has just done everything he can to continue to promote this program. And Commissioner Johnson, we appreciate your dedication to this, and we appreciate y'all being here today and your continuing that program and the legacy of that program. So thank you all very much. Congratulations. 
take one more minute. I'm sorry, I apologize. Take as many to as introduce you want. our new Tarrant County Horticulture agent. So Brittany started with us on the 4th of October. Um, she has a bachelor's in horticulture from Sam Houston State. Um, has worked in the industry for quite some time, doing commercial landscaping projects, and then also has worked at the Dallas Arboretum. Um, she just recently finished her master's in plant pathology, um, and we're real excited. She came extremely highly recommended from our state AgriLife team in College Station. Um, through the interview, she didn't reveal a couple of things that I found out when I actually called and checked references that Brittany actually, um, during her graduate program, was working on a watermelon project and identified three pathogens on watermelon that had never been identified before wow. and six, am I getting that right, six new pathogens to the state of Texas. So wow. she's already That's famous true. and yeah. has barely even um, gotten going here in Tarrant County. So very fortunate to have her join our team. She'll be overseeing the Master Gardener program, serving as their advisor. So we've got 400 plus volunteers through that. Um, and then also hoping, helping you know homeowners with their lawn and garden issues. So That's awesome. glad to have her as part of the team. Yeah. We're glad to have you. And you just uh, anytime you uh, you need anything, give us a call, and we'll be uh, willing to help most of the time. Great to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Where did you get your master's from? Texas A&M. Woo -hoo! <laughs> just had to do it, GK. <laughs> Next, we're going to recognize the uh, American Pharmacists Month uh, and National Pharmacy Week. And we have folks, I believe we have Dean uh, Sushi Madhaven, uh, Jennifer Fix, and then uh, some students. Do we have, y'all all come down. There you go. I saw the white coats earlier, so I knew we were, uh, we were getting ready to recognize some great folks, and we appreciate very much y'all being here. I'll read this into the record. Um, this is, again, Commissioner Johnson is uh, uh, the one that is sponsoring this proclamation. Commissioner Johnson, did you have anything you wanted to say before I read the resolution? No, I just want to say congratulations to all of them. You bet. Whereas pharmacy is one of the oldest of the health professions concerned with the health and well-being of all people, and whereas there are more than 23,000 licensed pharmacists in the state of Texas and over 315,000 pharmacists licensed in the United States to assure the rational and safe use of all medications, and whereas pharmacists have been at the forefront of the COVID-19 response as the most accessible health care providers, adapting to the needs of communities by providing drive-through testing, vaccinations, and patient education. And whereas federal and state authorities expanded pharmacists' authority to prescribe, dispense, and administer COVID-19 therapeutics to meet the needs of the community fighting the pandemic. And whereas it is important that all users of prescriptions and non-prescription medications or their caregivers be knowledgeable about the sh share responsibility for their own drug therapy, and whereas pharmacists are best positioned as the healthcare professionals to help patients remain adherent to their medication and to provide patient care that ensures optimal outcomes. And whereas the American Pharmacist Association, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, and the College of Pharmacy at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth have declared October as American Pharmacist Month and October 17th through the 23rd, 2021, as National Pharmacy Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim, the Octo proclaim October as American Pharmacist Month and October 17th through the 23rd as National Pharmacy Week in Tarrant County and urge all citizens to acknowledge and show appreciation for the valuable services of their pharmacists to provide safe and affordable medications and patient education and care. In witness whereof, we have here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 19th day of October, 2021. 
I'll move for its approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. You know, I, what I have seen and what, and having both elderly parents as well as uh, um, a mother in law who is now 96, is where y'all have been invaluable and I think is, have received much more attention is the ability for you to see overall what's happening with the patient. Because all too often now, that patient may be having prescriptions for medications from many different doctors who may not be communicating as well. And y'all have caught, I, I can think of many people who come up to me and said, the pharmacist caught that these two drugs were not, don't work well. They don't play well together in the sandbox. And so uh, I can't thank you enough for the job that you do and for you bringing new folks into the profession. Uh, Y'all do a great job at UNT and the Health Science Center, and uh, I want to thank y'all for being here today, and I'm very privileged to be able to, uh, to present this to you. So let's get over here, and let's get the, uh, y'all get, uh, who's going to take this? Okay, you're going to get, okay, it's got a flash three times, but it's not hanging. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge Whitley. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And thank you, all commissioners. I really do want to thank the court for recognizing pharmacists today. Indeed, uh, on behalf of the University of North Texas Health Science Center, College of Pharmacy, I'm the dean of the college, and I have some faculty here with me, Dr. Jennifer Fix, and I have two student pharmacists, Manoj Patel and Rebecca <coughs> Nelson. So they join me in also uh, th thanking you all for this honor. Um, also, this is on behalf of the 23,000 pharmacists in the state of Texas and over 300,000 pharmacists in the US. And indeed, uh, pharmacists have been in the forefront of this pandemic. And throughout this pandemic, they have remained open to make sure that medications are available to all of their patients. And now more recently, ph the pharmacy is the place to go if you want to get tested for COVID-19 or if you want to get a vaccination. The fact is that pharmacists are the medication experts in society, and they are the most accessible healthcare professional. 95% of the population live within five miles of a pharmacy. And if you look at the Gallup polls for the past 20 years, they've been the most trusted professional. So they do indeed play a very vital role in society. And Judge Whitley, thank you for your very kind comments about the role they play. And so thank you for recognizing all of the pharmacists and the critical role they play in society. Well, and, and I want to go, go ahead, come on for them. I just wanted to uh, thank the court and uh, take a moment to thank the pharmacist in Tarrant County and to ask the consumers to be patient and kind to the pharmacists because they seem a bit overwhelmed these days. <laughs> um, they've been busy with the COVID vaccines and it's also flu shot season. So I wanna remind everybody about getting your flu shot. And also they're still doing some COVID testing as well as their routine business of taking people, taking care of everybody's medicines day to day and answering questions and helping educate their patients. So if everybody would just take a moment to be grateful and thankful, we sure would appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, and I wanted to just add that y'all have played such a critical role in helping to roll out the vaccines and to increase the percentage of folks who have come in and who have who started that process or have started and completed that process. Without y'all, I don't think we could come anywhere close to uh, hitting the numbers that we've hit. And as you said, everybody's within about five minutes of a pharmacy. So I think our success in the future for the, the vaccines, for the boosters, for the tests, for all of these things are to work very closely with the pharmacies and with the pharmacists to, uh, to hit that, the numbers that we're all looking to gain. 
uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being a part and for helping us in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is the employee recognition. Again, this is one of my favorite times of the month. This is uh, when we get a chance to really recognize the heroes of Tarrant County, the folks who make this such a great place to live, to work, to raise a family. Um, you know, I, I really, I say it just, just about every time we do one of these that um, I have had a chance to visit other counties and I don't think there's a better place to be than in Tarrant County, Texas. Uh, and it's because of y'all and, and I was telling a group uh, recently, employees of Tarrant County, it is a job and fortunately we do pay you for that job. But I also think that many of y'all look at it very much as a passion, a passion for public service in whatever area you happen to be, uh, it is a passion uh, to try to provide the best service, whether it be in the jail, whether it be in public health, uh, whether it be on one of the road crews. Uh, everybody takes their position and their job very seriously, and we appreciate that. For the newbies, for you five-year-olds, <laughs> five-year-olds with the county. Um, what I have to say to everybody is my pronunciations sometimes lack a lot. So if you know where you are in the alphabet, if you feel like you should be next and it even begins to resemble what you think, uh, you know, I'm trying to say, uh, please stand up. It'll, um, they'll laugh at me. You don't have to worry about that. So we're going to start with the five-year employees. The first one is uh, Shadney Adams, Criminal Courts. Judge Brooke Allen, probate court number two. There's Judge Allen. David Bennett, the sheriff's office. Esther Castaneda, criminal district attorney's office. Juan Claudio, county clerk. Patricia Gamble, county clerk. Anthony Jackson, information technology. David Coy, Sheriff's Office. Christopher Lachance, Criminal District Attorney's Office. Ashley Lusk, County Clerk. Ronald Robbins, Jr., Facilities Management. Kevin Song, Information Technology. These are our five-year employees. Let's give them a great <laughs> Y'all can be seated. Now for our 10-year employees, David Barron, Information Technology, Timothy Canis, Sheriff's Office, Aaron Clark, Sheriff's Office, Lester Couch, Criminal District Attorney's Office, Paul Dozell, Sheriff's Office, Timothy Flores, Precinct 4. John Saul, Information Technology. Lacey Self, Sheriff's Office. And Noe Vera, Juvenile Services. These are our 10 year employees. Now for our 15-year employees, uh, Abernathy, Sheriff's Office, Stacy Baker, Sheriff's Office, Jacqueline Braxton, Human Resources. <laughs> All right now. Christina Couch Garza, I, I know I missed that one. Medical Examiner's Office, Jennifer Derry, Sheriff's Office, Patrick Etumna, Sheriff's Office, Karen Evans, Tax Office, 
Cecilia Fembres, Public Health. Kanisha Henderson, Public Health. Kelly Jones, District Clerk's Office. Charles Magoka, Sheriff's Office. Okay, now if it sounded like it, stand up. Gwen Peterson, Purchasing. Sarah Skiles, Medical Examiner. Elizabeth Ware, Tax Office. These are our 15-year employees. <laughs> 20 years. Christy Bellamy, Tax Office. Paul Burkett, Sheriff's Office. Johnny Dotson, Juvenile Services. Stacy Fatuna, Sheriff's Office. Frederick Rogers, Constable Number Four. Thank you, sir. And Ralph Smith, Transportation Services. Thank y'all. <laughs> now for our 25 plus, I call these individuals and. I was a little late in my calling, but I got a hold of everybody. Uh, first is, for our 25 employees, is Keisha Heath, the Sheriff's Office. 25 years, there she is. Started in the uh, Green Bay Center, then moved over to the Correction Center, um, spent some time in booking, and now is back out in the Green Bay Center. Um, when I asked her, what was a memorable moment. She said, in the beginning years, how folks really treated her. She said, I had a couple of family emergencies, uh, one with a daughter and then her mother passed away. And she said the folks were just unbelievable. They, they came around me, they helped me, they um, just, she said, I'm just not sure how I would have made it through it without them. When I asked her what she liked most, again, the family atmosphere, the people that she'd had a chance to work with, the benefits. Um, when I asked her if um, the time had flown by, she said, well, it didn't fly by quite as quickly in the beginning as it has now nearer the end. And uh, we both related to the fact that, you know, you blink now and two or three years or five years go by and uh, you, you're going from, a, from 20 to 25 or 25 to 30, as we're going to see in a few minutes. She said, uh, I will tell you that my faith in God is what has really helped me uh, as I have gone through the 25 years with the county. Uh, Keisha, we thank you very much for the 25 years of service you've given us. Next is David Jefferson with Public Health. Uh, he is the manager of the env environmental quality area. Uh, started out October the 2nd of 1995, so actually he's 26 years. Uh, he said, uh, I actually, he started out in Brazos County, spent about 13 years there, and then uh, moved, was in Arizona for about three years before coming back here. Um, he said, I asked him about memorable moments, and he said, well, one day, Judge Vandergriff referred to him as the king of sewage. Um, when I asked him what he liked most, he said, when he had a chance, um, he said, when I get a chance to take the time to help someone to solve a problem. Sometimes he's called the explainer. And, uh, you know, I think that's really true uh, with our folks in, in public health because you know, you think of them as, okay, that's viruses and that's disease and that's shots and that's pandemic, but it's also going out and helping people uh, with their properties, with water, with a lot of different things. And so that, and that's a very important part of that. Through the years, he said, getting to know folks in and out of the county. Uh, he said the people that he's had a chance to work with, he said it is a very large and Diverse. He said, I'm very proud of the diversity 
in our environmental group. Um, he says it's, it's something that he's just got a great group of folks uh, that are very focused on public service and working with that. Um, his father worked for Tarrant County. Now remember I said he's been here 26 years. His father was, and he's got his father's certificate right there. He was also with Tarrant County for 26 years and retired just a few months after David started. So that means that for over 52 years we've had a Jefferson uh, working with him. David, thank you so much for your years of service with Tarrant County. Thank you for yours, Jay. You bet. Um, next is Jeff Jones, the Sheriff's Department. There's Jeff, started out as a clerk in the jail, then uh, certified as a, a jailer, and then went into the patrol area. Uh, then moved over the, to the narcotics area and became one of the canine deputies. Um, and has, has worked with that for you know a number of years. Um, he said, what I like most about Tarrant County is the flexibility, also the variety of the different jobs and the different opportunities that he's had to, to work in uh, while he's been with the, with the county. And he said, and, and of course, the people. He said, I've had an opportunity to work with some great folks, uh, and it's really you know, something that he feels like has, has been fortunate and is something that he really enjoys. Jeff, thank you so much for your 25 years of service to Tank County. <laughs> now next, we are, or many of us know this person, uh, Lisa Willis, County Clerk's Office. Where's Lisa? We know her as the photographer because she puts out some of the greatest pictures. Uh, the pandemic book was something that she said, you know, that's something that was the memorable moment is, is getting to pick photos for that book. Um, she started out in deed records, then moved to uh, realty filings and is now uh, in the administration uh, department area. Uh, but she, she's had some of the best pictures of the old courthouse that I could ever hope to see. Um, she said that she loves the people that she's had a chance to, to work with, the benefits. She says, I love the way the county has that spirit of volunteering. And for most of y'all know this, I don't have to tell you because you're out there doing it. Meals on Wheels, Food Banks, United Way, one thing after another, if there's a need uh, and they come to the county and ask, our people are going to step up, given blood. It's just, you know, we're there to help. And um, again, I just can't say enough, it's that second mile. It's not something you're required to do. It's something that you want and choose to do. And again, I, I think that's what makes this county such a great place. Um, she said time has flown by. She said um, another thing that she has really been thankful for is while her kids were in college, they would do some interning and they would do some just you know temporary uh, work for the county while they were in college, and, and that's something that has meant a lot and was very special to her. Lisa, thank you so much for everything you've done. <laughs> Now we go to 30 years. Our first 30 year is David Cosby with the Sheriff's Department. There's David. Uh, started off in the Green Bay Jail, went to the Correction Center, um, then to the old jail, then to the hospital area, and then to courts. Uh, when I asked him what he liked most, it was the camaraderie, uh, the people that he's had a chance to work with. Um, he, he said, you know, that I've worked with the county for 30 years. He said, I've grown up with the county. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of folks, I've heard from a lot of different folks. Uh, time has flown by. Uh, prior to coming to the county, he served in the Marine Corps as well as in the Army. So thank you very much for your service. Um, 
he since in the last five years he's achieved master uh, peace officer as well as jailer um, and he he's a security deputy in the courts but he he kind of splits his time between the the plaza where the sheriff's uh, administrative offices are and the justice center uh, David thank you so much for your 30 years of service to tank David, if he brought someone with him. And I should have been asking this, like, David, did you bring someone with you? No. Huh? I asked. All right. If, as, as I kind of go through this, and I apologize for you 25-year folks, David brought his father's plaque, but if, uh, Keisha, did you have anyone that you brought with you? No, sir. Okay, uh, we talked about David. Uh, Jeff. Okay, Lisa. Okay. Okay. Our next thirty year is Tina Clay. <laughs> Tina is uh, in probate court number two. She uh, started out as a temporary, and then moved to Judge Furchell's court. Um, and then when Judge Furchell retired, uh, moved. To Judge Allen, or just continued to work in that court with uh, with Judge Allen. Uh, when I asked her what she liked most, she said it was the people and the staff that she worked with. Just a big family. Um, when she started with the county, she had a daughter that was 11 months old, hmm. and obviously is is now turning 31. I guess from that standpoint. <laughs> Uh, she never thought she would be here this long. She's only had two jobs. One working with the probate court, and I think the other was with a bank. And that bank has probably changed names 31 times since you, <laughs> since you left. Um, her daughter is now expecting a little boy. And I believe they're going to name it Lincoln. That's what you said her the other day. And she has a son getting married in about a month. So you got a couple of this, you got a couple of big events coming up. Uh, she said, I absolutely love working with Judge Allen and with the court family there in probate court number two. Tina, did you bring anyone with you? Thank you so much for the 30 years of service that you've given to Tarrant County. Next is Grant Letty. There's Grant. Uh, started out in the jail, uh, spent some time in patrol, and is now in the warrants area. Uh, he said this when I talked with him several years ago, that you know when I asked him his memorable moments, he said things are staying calm. <laughs> and no drama. And he said that same thing yesterday when I talked with him. He said, the last five years, calm, no drama. Um, when I asked him what he liked most, he said it was the job, it was dealing with folks. Um, when I talked with him five years ago, he, he has a bonus son. I, I call my, they're not stepchildren, they're not step grandchildren, their bonus. And I tell my bonus grandchildren that, you know, we got to pick you, the rest just came along. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, that's, that's always left an impression on them and I think that means a lot from that standpoint. Uh, and five years ago he was in the Army and then he had a son graduating from high school that was going to go into the Marine Corps. Uh, when I talked with him yesterday, his stepson <laughs> is now out of the Army. His son is not is out of the Marine Corps, but he's in the National Guard, and I guess just this past week was sent to the border. So uh, he's now on the, uh, on the border working. Um, Grant, thank you so much for the 30 years of calm that you've had with that guy. Now, it doesn't appear as though you brought anybody with you, but I want to check. Now, somewhere, but the, but the baby is missing now. So I wonder if the baby left with one of the earlier presentations. 
Okay. So that wasn't. I, I thought I was going to get. A, I thought I was going to get a grandbaby or. A, oh no. At they're this like, point. Yeah, you're right. Like that, okay. Next is Clarence Lyons, Precinct One, thirty years. Um. Okay. Wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't lose you. I just got to find you. <laughs> well, maybe I did lose you. Hold on. Don't, don't give up on me yet. Most people back there are the ones that are panicking because they're saying, uh-oh, uh-oh, what do we do with him? Um... <laughs> you want me to tell no, I you found him. Clarence? I found him. I found him. <laughs> I found him. Um, precinct one started out as a temp, went to full time position when one opened up, and started out as an operator one. Um, then he was uh, in the inmate program for several years, then operator two. Uh, eventually ended up on the park crew as a project supervisor and then when you got rid of the park he became uh, he's now over the great all crew uh, when I asked him what he liked most he said I enjoy working with the people and he said I just love what I do um, when I talked with him five years ago he had a five-year-old granddaughter well she's ten now but oh, by the way, uh, in addition to the one granddaughter, he now has eight new grandkids. Oh my goodness. And two great grandkids. Um, he said the time has really flown by. Clarence, we very much appreciate the 30 years of service you gave to Parent County. Now, uh, for those of you in the Did DA's office, Veronica Sargent also has 30 years, but she's on vacation this week and was not able to make it down here, uh, but wish her, wish her a uh, happy anniversary when she gets back. Okay, our last person is Fred Walters. And it doesn't look like Fred was able to make it. He is with the uh, with Judge Westfall's uh, court, the 371st. Uh, actually, has been around the county for um, 33 years. So, uh, if you have a chance, um, please thank Fred for his uh, for his 33 years of service with the county. Judge, would you ask Clarence? the question so you're right I, I didn't ask him and you were you knew that one Clarence stand up and I bet you got somebody with you Alicia well I got got kind of rattled when I had lost Clarence. Uh, it took me a while to find him. So again, thank you. Alicia, thank you for being here today. Um, 760 years of service. Wow. I can't say, uh, I, I can't say enough good things about everybody and the job that they do. We got refreshments back in 504C. Uh, thank you again for everything y'all do for the county. I want to move to receive and file not only the employee recognition but also the United Way campaign. Second. We have a motion second. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Y'all take a
I heard you. <laughs> Court, uh, you have before you the consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Johnson, you're on mute. Commissioner Ficus? Yes. Johnson. We'll give him just another second or two. Okay, then uh, motion passes 4 0. Um, say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on time. Motion passes unanimously. Members of the court, we can now go to Excuse the. Excuse me, I've got announcements. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm going to make this brief because I've got quite a bit to cover. I'll make this quick, rather. One is we are in the second day of early vote for the November election. Um, it's important, especially if you live in Precinct 2, that I want to tell you what is on your ballot, what may be on your ballot, depending on where you live. Um, for all Texans, though, we have eight constitutional amendments that are on the ballot. For all Tarrant County residents, we have Proposition A and Proposition B that are on the ballot. And then if you live in Mansfield ISD, you have the penny swap on your ballot. So please make sure that you make your voice heard in this election. Um, later on today in our agenda, or I think we did it in our consent, was a ride to the election. So specifically, if you live in um, Precinct 2 in Arlington, you can schedule a free ride to go vote through Arlington Via or Arlington Handy Tran. Um, this, there is a website that provides all the options regardless of where you live in the county. Then also, uh, this Thursday, we will be hosting our second county redistricting community input session from 6 to 8 p.m. at Dan Diaper Career and Tech Center there in East Arlington. Again, that's 6 p.m. Um, you can come there to hear more about the county's redistricting process and to provide your public input. And then last is next Monday via Zoom, we, were, we are hosting our regular quarterly Precinct 2 update on the JPS bond. So you will hear from our two Precinct 2 appointees as well as the Broadest Levis team and our Tarrant County Hospital District CEO. That is at 11 a.m. next Monday, October 25th. Um, please contact our office or visit the county website so that you can register to participate in that virtual meeting. And that's it. Thank you. Anybody, um, anybody else have any announcements? We have that. tonight at 6 o'clock, I believe, a uh, redistricting meeting at our office at 645 Grapevine Highway. Starts at, I think it's was scheduled about an hour and a half, two hours. Six o'clock, yes. Huh? It starts at six o'clock, sir. Six? Yes, sir, 6 p.m. Well, okay, that's what I thought I said. Yep, six o'clock. Thank you. Okay, there's no other announcements. Then, uh, Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the court, we can now go to the briefing items. We're going to go to item B first. This is the public input session as it relates to redistricting of the commissioner's court precincts. Uh, Mr. Bob Heath is here to address the court at this time. Thank you. Good morning. Um, what we have today is a public input session, and we've been having these across the county in the various precincts. As Commissioner Fick has said, we're having one in Precinct 3 this evening. Uh, there are also ones coming up in uh, Precincts 1 and Precinct 2, and we've already had a couple uh, before. And this is one here today um, at the uh, Commissioner's Court meeting. Uh, the main thing is that the 2020 census revealed that the commissioner precincts uh, here 
the ones that have been in use since uh, 2010 or 2011 uh, are actually in population balance. Uh, they were 10 years ago. They're actually closer to being balanced uh, today, 10 years later. And because of that, there's no legal requirement for the commissioner's court to change those precincts. It may if it wants to, but there's no requirement that it do so. And a few weeks ago when we presented this to the court, uh, it decided it wanted to give people the opportunity to comment uh, and go through public hearings to see what they thought about leaving the precincts as they are uh, versus uh, proposing changes. And so that's what's happening today and has been happening uh, throughout the county. Here are the current uh, commissioner precincts. I'm not going to linger on that, but they're the ones that have been in use. And here is the population uh, breakdown. And as you see, uh, the ideal size for a commissioner's precinct is roughly 527,000 persons. And the precincts have a total maximum deviation um, under the current population of less than 2%. And so that's very close to being in balance. The standard that we'd like to look at to make sure that they will meet legal muster is a 10% deviation. This is less than two. Um, I'm going to skip over these other charts, which are just more details uh, of, that, of those population numbers. And here you can see the racial an ethnic uh, breakdown in the county um, over these next uh, three slides. This is uh, the African-American population. Uh, the darker the color, uh, the greater the concentration. Um, and largely in Precinct 1, also in Precinct 2, and some scattered population uh, throughout. And of course, there'll be other areas that don't show up on the map because it's less than 20% of the voting precinct. And here is the Hispanic population. And again, Precinct 1, Precinct 4, and Precinct 2 is where that population is. Uh, and it's more spread out. Um, and finally, this is the Asian uh, population, uh, and it is more spread out. Uh, this chart is a little different because the Asian population is not as numerous as the others. And so while that chart, the others said 0 to 20, 20 to 40, et cetera, uh, this one is 0 to 10, uh, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and that way we can see the population a little better. Now, the commissioner's court adopted criteria uh, that we want the, uh, any plan, uh, the existing plan, or any new one that they decide uh, to do to follow. And I will just say that these criteria sometimes are in conflict with one another. You can't, uh, you know, maybe if you're going to have uh, equal population, that may militate against some compactness and, and so forth. But basically these are that we're going to use identifiable boundaries so people can see where uh, the precinct is and understand that that'll be streets, major highways, uh, rivers, creeks, etc. cetera. Uh, we want to maintain communities of interest in neighborhoods to the extent possible. Uh, again, as we have to have equal population, it may not always be possible to do that, but we want to try. Uh, we want to use whole voting precincts if possible. That helps uh, election administration and avoids confusion. Uh, we want to base the plan on existing districts so that we don't start with a blank slate. We're going to have districts of relatively equal size. Uh, we want districts that are compact and contiguous. We want to keep existing incumbents in their district, and that's something that obviously people think about that as benefiting incumbents, but it also benefits the voters because they, uh, it lets them decide who's going to be elected and who's not, uh, and doesn't push somebody uh, out of the district. And finally, we're going to narrowly tailor our plan to comply with the Voting Rights Act. And 
in order to comply with the law relating to redistricting, we've got to have equal population, relatively equal. Um, we need to make sure that our districts don't have the purpose or effect of discriminating against racial or language minority groups. And we want to adopt districts where race is not the predominant consideration, but instead the use of race is narrowly tailored to ensure compliance with the Voting Rights Act. And that's basically the standard that the Supreme Court has set. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll just open it up to see if there's anybody else that has any comments. Uh, we're happy to take comments. There are also uh, comment forms out in the um, lobby that you can fill out, give your name, address, and any written comment. And even if you make an oral comment, we would like you to fill one of those out uh, so that we have a record of it. So this is a public hearing. Public comment, yes. Public comment area. So if anyone does wish to come forward and make a public comment, or if you don't want to make a public comment, as Bob just indicated, you can fill out a card that is outside, uh, and you're welcome to do that, and we would very much appreciate you doing that, because we do want to give everybody an opportunity to make any comments or suggestions that uh, you may have, so as we're considering any changes that we might make, uh, we would uh, be able to take those into account. Okay. Court members, anything? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Judge. So, members of court, if we can now go to the uh, uh, briefing item, it'll be item 11A. This is the current and uh, emerging health issues. Uh, this will be a, a something that uh, Mr. Tanasia will be presenting to the court at this time. Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the court. Good morning, Good morning. So we're back here after almost two weeks, and uh, I come bearing good news. <laughs> the trend is down for COVID. <laughs> the numbers are starting to look much improved. Uh, a lot has happened, obviously, in the last two weeks, but uh, we're at 357,000 and some change in the number of cases and 4,564 deaths. But the significant part is hospitalizations are trending down. Our case counts are trending down. All of the indicators are in a downtrend, so that's great news. Uh, we're almost half uh, in terms of hospitalizations where we were two weeks ago. So we have 456 people in the hospital confirmed with COVID. That's 10.71% of the capacity. Pediatric hospitalizations are down. Two to three weeks ago, we were at like 40 some, and now we're at 15 kids in the hospital. 3.72% of pediatric bed capacity. Trauma service area E is down significantly. 1,568 people in the hospital. That's 9% of hospital capacity. So overall, very significant improvements over the last two weeks. And as you can see on the trend charts, on the left, that's the, that's the case chart, the epidemic curve. It's certainly pointing down in a sharp downtrend. Death data on the right is starting to show declines emerge. Uh, it's going to be slow because it's a lagging indicator, but we're starting to see certainly good news develop there as well. And then our uh, virus spread rate, the r naught, is below 1. It's 0.84, so that's great news. We're slowing down in our community on a terms of virus spread. One thing I do want to point out, by definition, we're still at a high level of community spread. It's going to take a little bit for us to moderate. Uh, as far as a state goes, um, the only state that I know of currently is California. That's in moderate spread. The rest of the country is still in high spread. Now, there might be pockets, different communities that are ahead, but we'll get there eventually. I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. So uh, all of these indicators here are pointing lower. Our uh, positivity rate is starting to come down. Um, and then there's that threshold, the 10% mark. That's, you know, if you start getting below 10%, that's great news in the community. Case counts on the right hand uh, side bottom corner. Uh, we're approaching the threshold to get below 100. I think we're at 179 per 100,000. So again, all improvements in the, in the right direction. Um, so things are starting to look fairly comfortable. Uh, heading into uh, Halloween, I think people can and get some comfort that it's not raging out there in the community. They can try to have a somewhat of an enjoyable Halloween event. 
Our guidance remains the same. Try to use as much precautions as you can. Put masks under your costume if, if you can weave those in into your costume. Uh, try not to go in large groups of people. Go individual family units just like we did last year. Some might say that's too strict, but while this is still out there, let's be a little bit more careful. It doesn't hurt. And those that are handing out candy, try not to do individual handouts, you know, have little bags lined up on a table. You enjoy, you know, wave at the kids, let them come by and pick it up. Uh, you know, there's no need to be scared, but certainly some judicious use of, you know, these common sense precautions, I think, still warranted. Uh, national trends, of course, the southeast uh, in, in Texas, we were engulfed very early on in this recent surge. Uh, but now it's moved on. I think the, the western half of the country and the Midwest is really in the grips of it, but I think it's starting to fade off in the southeast and, and in Texas. So uh, things are starting to look good here. Um, the message remains the same. It really hasn't changed. If you're eligible for a vaccine, get vaccinated, wear a mask uh, while there's still active surge going, and then avoid large crowds that are not necessary. So those three messages still work and, and it seems to be, you know, the mantra right now. Quick update on vaccines. A lot has happened in the vaccine world as well, uh, but the fully vaccinated counts are slowly but surely improving all across, including here in Tarrant County. Uh, 1.43 million people have been fully vaccinated. That's 60% of the eligible population over 12 and 49% of the total population. Uh, so things are looking good. Um, and then of course, improvements in every category, race, ethnicity, age groups, uh, things are certainly starting to slowly come together, but you know, more work to be done. And then finally here, there's some updates, but one, one button that we added on the dashboard now that a lot of boosters are, are coming through, I wanted to show that there's a booster dose button. So almost 51,000 booster doses have been delivered. It's a little slower than what we had hoped, uh, but a lot of this is because early on, the uh, booster or the vaccine went a lot to uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities and healthcare workers and so forth. And we've been talking to DSHS. They have a plan to start addressing some of these long-term care facilities and nursing homes. Um, so eventually, this will all pick up as well. Now, the Moderna and the J and J have been approved now, haven't they? So the FDA committee has recommended a half-dose Moderna booster and a full dose J and J booster, but the final approval is expected through ACIP and CDC by the end of this week. After that, they will be eligible to be distributed to the public. Um, so final approvals are going to be, um, we're expecting later on this week, I think Thursday is when ACIP meets and usually CDC makes the recommendation the same evening. Um, so we'll find out. And then um, the key here is Moderna third booster is six months from your second dose, and it's a half dose booster. Again, I think we talked about Pfizer having 30 micrograms in each dose, so they didn't have that dose. So it was 30, 30, 30, you get 90 micrograms. <coughs> Moderna already had 100 micrograms in each dose. So it's 100 plus 100, and now a 50 six months later. So it's a half dose booster. Johnson & Johnson, they said it's a single dose vaccine, but now the booster is authorized at two months after that single dose. Yes, sir. Is there any concern about those that might have gotten a Moderna booster before this half dose and got a whole dose? So, so the ones that are approved currently for that, sir, are people that might have uh, immunocompromising conditions. And that one is what is called an additional dose. I know it's, it's very confusing. <laughs> But those folks can get a full dose of Moderna booster, uh, the additional dose, because they have conditions that make them immunocompromised. So they need that little extra dose to keep that immune system going. So that is absolutely OK. Trust me, even in public health circles, we've been telling you know, feedback to the CDC, you know, this is very confusing for us to even explain and keep straight. <laughs> But we'll, we'll try to make it as simple as possible on the website with charts and graphs. But easiest way is just to come to the sites, get vaccinated. This is more for our teams to worry about what dose to give people. People just need to know they're eligible for their booster dose and they can come. The um, 
back and forth on the do you mix and match or whatever where are you on that so officially they have not yet authorized they've they've said we need more data but media coverage has been anticipated anytime soon that they will come out and say yes mixing and matching is allowed so far officially it's not allowed what they have said in the past especially for the one a situation that commissioner Fickus was mentioning those that are immunocompromised there was such a worry that they're going to get caught up in the delta surge let's say they went to get in a pfizer and it wasn't available go get a moderna no problem as long as it's mrna vaccine you can mix and match but it was very limited situations not to be commonly used only when the other vaccine is not available so it's happening in some places but generally officially they have not yet approved it so Vinny, yes, i heard everything you just said <laughs> <They're good laughs> <But I'm, laughs> make sure i understand so like on saturday we're hosting a drive-through vaccine clinic right yes and we said that boosters are available, but which boosters are going to be available? And I know that your team is partnering with us, so thank you for so that. But. Currently, officially only the Pfizer booster is available. Okay. But by Saturday, we're really hoping that the ACIP and CDC would have finalized the recommendations. Okay. Our doctors are watching those as well, so they'll update the medical orders, and we should be ready if everything comes on a timely okay. fashion. But so for our promotion purposes, just say... Boosters will be available. Okay, boosters available. Okay, very good. Because okay. we'll, and we'll give them is, the right booster. And that's from 10 to 2 at the Tarrant County Southeast Annex, located in downtown Arlington. For yes, ma'am. So, yes, okay, ma thank you, Benny. And then, um, again, like I said, we're waiting on ACIP and CDC approvals. Last time when they went through this Pfizer process, we got four different recommendations, and the ultimate say is with the CDC. So we'll wait for that final approval, and we'll see what comes out. One final comment on vaccine updates different than COVID. Uh, the county is launching an expanded flu vaccine access program. Uh, you all saw an item on the consent agenda, uh, but the, the, we are partnering with some local pharmacies. And I think it's going to be a two-part deal. A couple of pharmacies were able to get their agreements to us this week, and another couple maybe coming next week. But today, uh, we have approvals to work with uh, Alberson TomTom and Berkshire, which they don't have a whole lot of locations in Tarrant County, but um, that is approved. It is a expanded flu vaccine access program for the uninsured. So if people go into a pharmacy, one of those participating pharmacies, and they do not have insurance, they can still get vaccinated. The county will pick up that cost on the back end with the pharmacy under our arrangement. We did something similar last year. Uh, it was well received, even though the participation was sort of mild. But we're starting a little bit earlier this season knowing that flu is coming in a little heavy this year so we want people to have no barriers and participate in getting flu vaccinations additionally last year for the first time cdc's adult safety net program had given local health departments and state health departments flu vaccine under that program uh, it was a one-time deal well this year again they've decided well given that the pandemic's still going on and hospitals are overloaded and so forth we will bring that program back. So sometimes here mid to late October, we will receive that adult safety net flu vaccine also. So the health departments will also have similar uh, vaccine to provide to uninsured. So just wanted to make sure that's av uh, you know, available and people are aware that an expanded flu access program is available in the county. So Vinny, I can't remember from the agreement, what's the effective date? So when can people start showing up at, for right now at Brookshire's and Albertson's? So we will post that on our website. Officially, the agreement is approved today, so technically they can, but I want to make sure the pharmacy partners are ready because uh, they were waiting for the signed contract. Sure. So we will put that on our website. We'll have a page about it, and I'll try to make sure all of you are aware if we, if we know from the pharmacy partners if they want a particular date. but. Um, I know in the conversations, the Tom Thumbs and Alberson people were really excited about this because they were getting calls from the public. Hey, you had a program last year from the county. What happened this year? So we'll hopefully soon. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. I will tell you that the pharmacies are very excited about this. It, it really helps them because it used to be they, they, they advertised free vaccines, but it was if you had insurance. Now, they don't have to worry about that anymore. And the pharmacists that I've spoken with, they're really appreciative of the county stepping up and doing this again. And, um, and so uh, we look forward to that relationship that we have with the pharmaceutical 
uh, or the pharmacies in, in the major food markets. So Do we have an idea of how many pharmacies we're going to be? I'll, I'll have to go look. I'm asking them for locations that are participating because not all of their locations are going to be participating. I know that the bigger group is going to be probably coming next week because we're expecting Kroger and Walgreens. Uh, this, this one's a kind of a lighter group with Tom Radberson having more. I think Brookshire has like only one location in Tarrant yeah. County, yeah, that's but that's okay. I think the one they have is in Azle. CVS. Fort, yeah. CVS unfortunately did not participate last year. We didn't have them on the calls. They, they didn't come. And uh, Walmart also, they declined. They had their own programs and things that they run, so they did not participate. Tom Thumb, Albertsons, Kroger's, they're all in this program. Yes, sir. That's pretty good coverage. Yes, and again, we're, we're open to working with any par partner pharmacy. Um, again, you know, with the flu season upon us, we just want to make sure that it's out there and at least some coverage is there for, for the public. And of course, health department's always there, but we wanted to make sure more locations are there. Okay, um, testing operations. So it's kind of good news <laughs> that testing demand and volume is down. But it also presents a uh, operational challenge for us because we now have a lot of sites out there that are, that are providing testing. But the numbers are starting to look pretty low. Most of the locations are bringing 20, 30 samples a day. Um, so we're starting to, this week is sort of our last week of expanding test, expanded testing. In fact, in the Northwest at, uh, at the Precinct 4 subcourthouse, we did a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule just to make sure that our schedule was not a, a roadblock of any kind to get people tested, but there wasn't a lot of demand. So um, Monday was like two people showed up for testing. You know, that was pretty low. So this week is the last week we're doing this expanded testing, and then starting this weekend, we're going to bring each location down to one day a week just to make sure we can consolidate the need for testing. Now, we'll schedule it such a way that at least one public testing site is open on a given day. So it'll be like Mondays, one side, Tuesdays, another side, and so forth, and we'll try to cover weekend days and longer hours. But I just wanted you to be aware, for now, we're going to scale this down. And if the need emerges again, we'll, we'll expand that up. Uh, and we'll keep watching the data. If, if the numbers really crater, we may have to shut down some locations in the next two, three weeks. But we'll bring that back to court and discuss that before we, before we move, move to that. And the updated schedule will be posted on our tarrantcounty.com slash COVID testing website. So starting this weekend, people will have, again, six locations, but limited number of days. That's it. Any, any questions on any of that? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. for that interruption. Right? No, no, no. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Members, Corey, we can go to the administrator section now. On item A1, we're requesting that you receive and file the um, county's weekly overview of the COVID-19 Recovery Act report. Move approval. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Members Court, on item number two, we're requesting that the court approve a letter of engagement between the county and Deloitte and Touche to serve as the county's outside auditor for the fiscal year, which ends September 30th, 2021. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? And what, what year of engagement with Deloitte and This Touche? is our second audit year. Second audit? Yes, sir. Okay. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Schaffner to present item number three. Thank you, Mr. Manias. Judge, commissioners. This morning, staff is here to um, outline for you all the current fiscal recovery funds or the state and local fiscal recovery fund um, budgeted plan for the commissioner's court for how you all, um, from the direction that we previously received and the uh, recommendations of our FRF work group, how a 
at one particular way that these funds can be budgeted for the next year and for the program uh, lifespan. Uh, with the fiscal recovery funds, and again, these are the funds that were authorized under the American Rescue Plan Act uh, of this year that President Biden signed into law. They coincide also with another item that we have to kind of bring to you together. Um, the, the two pieces of the, the puzzle as we're looking at uh, our recovery plan funds. This one is also the coronavirus relief funds, the CRF funds authorized in March of 2020 under the CARES Act. So the CRF funds, again, under the CARES Act expire on December 31st of 2021. That's December 31st of this year. And so staff is seeking a commissioner's court uh, approval of a plan to close out our CRF grant program. So that's the part A of what we're looking for. In order to accomplish that and to be able to uh, spend down the remaining of our funds and use it towards uh, eligible expenditures that the county has already incurred, um, staff would recommend that we, uh, the commissioner's court, uh, direct staff to apply any remaining CRF funds towards presumed salaries. So again, that's under A over here, which is the closeout of the Coronavirus Relief Fund grant monies. The second part of it is that we currently have some projects and positions that are in, that are being um, pulled out of the Coronavirus Relief Funding that we need to then take those projects, positions, and programs and shift them over to the county's fiscal recovery funds, the FRF funding through ARPA. And those particular items, uh, there's a significant amount, I believe it's about $12.5 million annualized um, and program budgeted. Some of that's an annual amount, others are program life. Um, that we are seeking, again, court to remove those from, F from CRF, put those over in the fiscal recovery fund bucket and authorize those positions and programs out of there. And then through action that court has done um, and direction given to staff starting on August the 3rd of this year uh, and moving forward, you'll see on the two green columns uh, on your document, on your uh, very large spreadsheet, one's the um, programs that are authorized. Again, those are programs that we have received from direction from commissioner's court or you all have uh, explicitly authorized. And the other one are the FRF work group recommendations. Those are items that um, departments and folks internal to the county have requested funding for, have gone before our work group to make sure that they do meet recommendations as well as uh, budget admin and others work through whether or not they're justified as actually being needed and necessary. And then the, you'll see within that column. So ultimately we are seeking court to approve the FRF work group recommendations to go into the uh, authorized program column, and then for you all to vote to move forward as a budgeted amount, um, not specifically line item, but as budgeted programs, those uh, items under that program's authorized column. So those are the two specific actions that we're looking for. I know there are a lot of machinations in, either, in both of those, but those are the two items that staff is looking for today. So when you say budgeted programs, you're talking about authorizing specific categories of activities associated with dollar amounts uh, for later development of specific programs under those categories. Yes, sir. Um, such as the, the first item, the capital, if we could take it for an example. This would authorize us, staff, to start working to uh, develop out the, those capital projects that have been identified uh, that on, was presented to August on, before court on August the 3rd. So we would start developing those out and they would come back to commissioner's court uh, as through the normal agenda process as an item under um, purchasing to go forward with HVAC units, for an example, or another or a particular contract for someone. So it will be coming back to court. This is just giving us the authorization to move forward. You know, I, th I think one of the concerns that I have is, for example, if we authorize, that doesn't mean it's necessarily, it, 
and, and maybe this is the second part of that so that I can be sure that I understand when we move because once we've authorized something that says you can do it and from this point forward I, you know I'm gonna have to say to you I'm confused and you and I talked about this yesterday yes sir uh, because we talk about the fact that we still have CARES money left. And as I told you yesterday, I was under the impression that we had done everything we could to allocate all the CARES money through 2020. And, uh, and I thought that between 2020 and December of 2020, we were told that CARES money has been taken care of and we don't have to worry about it. And yet we've got almost 14 million related to CARES money in this. And so, and I also have talked about, and I'm looking for Helen, as well as the, uh, the auditor's office, of saying that I wanted us to identify money that we were able to... Apply to eligible expenditures. Apply to, no, not to eligible expenditures. Apply to any expenditures we want. We took CARES money, we applied it to eligible, which freed up money that then when we decided we wanted to do rental assistance or business grants, and the auditor, rightly so, was not sure that it could be tied directly to COVID, therefore we couldn't spend CARES money on it this money would be eligible to be spent on those type of programs. So, uh, you know, that went from, yesterday we were saying, well, we still had 30 million of CARES money that we needed to do something with. Um, and so I'm, I'm confused from that standpoint. Also, we're, you know, we authorize something and then sometimes it'll, the actual move forward appears on the consent agenda. So at this point in time, I would like to ask from this point forward that we don't put expenditures of CARES money or ARPA money on the consent agenda. I would like for there to be an item and it could be, here's all the CARES money we're spending today and we want you to authorize it, but it's none of it on the consent agenda and the same with ARPA money because I would like for us to be able to be a little bit more careful when we're actually authorizing the expenditure and I mean for example if you look at the the FRF work group recommendations that first item there says additional space for Tarrant County Medical Examiner you and I talked about this yesterday because I brought up the question yes sir what would you believe that we're doing with that I've been told that it is space to deal with the trucks that they have out there. I think it's leasing the truck, the coal trucks, the refrigerated trucks. Well, you know, there's just things like that that I feel like we need to, I just need to better understand. Um, so may I, may I comment? Sure. That? First of all, if, if you would like, or any court member would like, for us to make sure that we don't put anything on consent as it relates to those type of expenditures and, and mark that on the agenda so that everybody is very clear what we're voting on, we can make that happen. There's, there's no... I'd like for that to happen. Okay. So... And what's important to mention on that part is that's, that's not what we originally agreed to do. So we originally agreed that it was, that it was going to go on consent. That was my memory of conversations months ago. So we are changing course. So I just, because I know that there was some confusion, but I always understood that we were going to see some of these um, things implemented as consent items. So, so we now would, we're saying that we're not going to do that, which I'm well, fine. With, I'm fine either way with uh, it. But. And, and it's it, whatever the whatever any individual court member would like. Sure. On that, so. That's what I'd like. Sec, second of all. <clears throat> We have enough expenditures that we can apply the CARES Act funds to, okay? And so we don't have this extra surplus, but if we apply, if, if, we, if we move the CARES Act or if we fund those things, it frees up cash. 
and we have in this current budget, 2022, we have a contingent revenue of, I think, $20 million, which will fill that bucket. And it will then get to the point, Judge, that you will have those extra revenues that you are asking about that, that technically do not have any strings on and you can expend those, whatever the legitimate expenditure that a county can make for those monies. Well, and that's, and what I hope that we have is a very good accounting of the money that is in that bucket. Now, right now that bucket may be in cash carry forward. It's, it is in cash carry forward, but I wanna be sure that we have distinguished what's in that bucket and that it's not just grown in so, so with this $20 million anticipated revenues, there's an offsetting anticipated expenditures, and they have not been identified. But they will be some, it's kind of like our contingency. Our, I understand. And so, so that gives the commissioner's court the flexibility to spend those dollars the way you would like to have them spent. I honestly believe that that is a good move to make because, first of all, it, 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 answers the question and allows the auditor and the budget and our office to close out CARES, okay, because that has to happen by the end of this year. It frees up the type of money that, that you're talking about, Judge, which creates greater flexibility to the commissioner's court on, on different ways that the only caveat you'd have on expending those funds is that it has to be for an expenditure that a county has the authority to make and everything that we've talked about you have that authority okay so it, it accomplishes what i believe that the team would like to accomplish and at the same time give the court the flexibility that you need if you want to make those type of expenditures and your yesterday i think you were saying that that was we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million cares dollars left yes sir there's somewhere depending on how the po shake out if Commissioner's Court give us the authority to close out CARES, depending on how some of those POs uh, are closed out, uh, it should come in somewhere around 30 million, give but or I take. I thought that what you just said was is that, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we have spent, as of the end of last year, December of last year, we could have spent all of our CARES money. We had and, eligible expenditures yes, that sir. we could apply the CARES fund to. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is I don't want us to come in here and approve something because you tell us that we've got to spend the 30 million when we could have already spent, we, we could and have already spent the 30 million or spent everything that we had left in CARES in the current or the fiscal year that ended September the 30th. So that's, that's one thing. And then I think the other thing that we had asked for and have been asking for is the fact that two or three weeks ago we talked about the fact that we had authorized the expenditure of over a hundred million dollars and as I recall most of us didn't realize that that had actually been done and that's what I'm saying is I want to be sure that we know when we're authorizing and what we're authorizing it for and especially now we're today we're going to get the interim report for our needs survey, but you know, and I and I know there are certain things that we needed to and and have spent thus far, but I'm glad that we're getting our needs survey today and that we can begin to maybe, if we agree with what the needs survey says, then begin to make sure that what we're spending money on agrees with what that says. So bottom line, let's spend the uh, CARES Act dollars first. Let's make sure that we spend them all by December 30th. And uh, let's keep a very close accounting and make sure that the court is keenly aware of the expenditures and the balances under ARPA funding. Yes, sir. 
I personally think that the strategy that, that the team has laid out and, and as you move not only for action today, but in the future, is, is the best strategy that you can utilize. And it gives you the greatest flexibility that you want. And, and one of the questions that I had posed in previous weeks, and I will do it again today, yes, is sir. we've got a lot of stuff in capital. And I know you've outlined to us, mm -hmm. you've given us an outline of the capital. Uh, and some of that, you know, we've authorized it. So it could be spent, but I'm not so sure that I realize that some of this stuff wouldn't be more routine. And instead of spending our ARPA funds for that, I'd rather that have been spent in our regular routine type budgets. And that took me back to asking for the last master plan that we had. And, you know, I don't know when that was. I, I think it was a 10 year plan. And I don't know when it was, and I don't know what it looked like, and I don't know what progress we're making, because we're now authorizing a 20-year plan, and I'd like to get a better idea for, you know, what's happened to the 10-year. What's year. left. Yeah. yeah, where are we? And, and we make plans, but if we're not really moving on and following up, then I don't know that it's necessary for us to spend so much money obligating or it's, it obviously doesn't obligate us. That's the whole thing is that we're spending money for a 20-year plan when maybe the 10-year plan will still go out far enough to accomplish what we need. Understood. And I don't know if that means we need, If am I correct that if we've authorized a program, then everybody can proceed and spend the money because we've said it was authorized? No. So, so how we're understanding, let's make sure that court and staff have like understandings on, on this particular item. So such as the, the uh, space, facility space study, uh, I believe it um, has been that um, RFP has been out. I do believe they have responses back in. Yes. And so it will be coming back to court to award a, um, a, a vendor for that space study based on the RFP. So that's a process that, again, it will come back to court. This is allowing us to begin the process to go through to actually get the RFPs out there, the RFQs, develop those strategies and, and work this forward to where we can bring something actually back to court for specific action where you're obligating funds and committing dollars. Just authorizing the direction to head into. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's more akin to setting up a budget and then yes, approving sir. expenditure yes, items right. at this court it, as they occur it, under that budget. And it, I'm okay with that, except that usually when we go to the RFP process, we pretty well decide that once it comes back mm -hmm. and there's a recommendation, we're going to approve that. And so before, and so this could end up being an exception. That's why I would like to see the 10 year plan or the last okay. plan. It may not be a 10 year. It may have been a okay. five year and it may have been 10 years ago. I would just like to see the last plan that we had, get an update on that. And then before I determine that I want to spend money to do a 20 year plan, okay. if we still have nine years left on the 10 year plan. So we, we can get the, yes. that plan up to the court. What it does give you the opportunity to do is move forward with the RFP bring that to court, and then several decisions could be made at that time. First of all, the funding source as to where you're going to fund it. You can either, you know, you'll still have the ability to have this discussion that you're having now. And prior to that, you'll see the 20, if it is a 20 year plan, I thought it was a 10 year plan, but we'll go back and check. Uh, you'll see that and you can have discussion because there's been times when we've done RFPs or RFQs we're at the point of, of either approving or not approving those, we simply didn't take any action at all. But we can't get to that point until we, we get to this process. And to just to piggyback on Mr. Manius's comment, um, with the desire for there to be no consent items, that means that requests to take beds or to go out on RFPs won't be on consent for uh, ARPA related items. It'll be something that you all will have to take a specific action on before we go out to, to bed. And so I, just to be very I'm, clear. That that's what I'm looking for. But what I'm looking for is maybe one agenda item that says here are the CARES Act or here are the ARPA uh, 
projects that we may that we're gonna right now suggest that they be paid for with ARPA funds. And it gives me a chance to at least say no, I think that ought to be paid for out of the normal budget and that may influence where we end up doing it. So we can set the agenda to make sure we'll put them all we'll probably what we'll probably do is put them all under the administrator section and that way you'll capture it there and we'll make sure that it's clearly defined in the agenda itself that where the funding source is. Okay. So in for the the action that staff is currently uh, coming to Commissioner's Court regarding again two steps. First off regarding the CRF funding that we would close out the CRF funding as of October 31st to where we would all requisitions and POs would go away and then we would take those funds uh, whatever is, is left over and apply them to the presumed um, payroll expenditures, presumed salary expenditures that are eligible uh, and go ahead and, and move forward with that. So that's part A and uh, Renna, Ms. Tidwell has it been. Which part B? Then part B will be to move over the FRF recommendations, work group F recommendations to the programs budgeted. Maybe we don't say authorized anymore. Maybe we say budgeted on the spreadsheet just to clear, um, clear clearly wording to move those over to the budgeted list and and then um, have the court approve the budgeted list at this time. And is that your request to the that court? Is my, that would be my request for approval. Can we do both of those with one motion? Yes, you may. I move approval of the recommendations. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, with regards to the FRF recommendations that you're moving over, um, what was the co-file again? The co -file. Helen, you, I'll let Helen address that one specifically. She worked on that. That's to give the district clerk the ability to put items online so that the uh, defense attorneys or anyone requesting the information can seek it online instead of coming into the office, having face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the clerks at that time. Currently, the... But don't they pay for that with a subscriber's fee? I oh, don't know the answer to that. I don't know if this would be part that he would be making available to them or would that, I don't see, I was looking for somebody from the district clerk's office here. He's probably back there eating cookies. <laughs> I will go search him down. Because, because I don't know the answer to that. Go ahead. I, I have a question on the translation services, if you just elaborate on that. Well, the translation services are for uh, rental and um, different, uh, ads that are put, being put out to be in various languages. So basically it's just like at a, um, on an ad hoc basis? Okay. We have, that's correct. We have a contract with that service now, and so it would be utilizing it for those specific needs, not in general, but just those specific needs. Okay. Anything, any sign that needs to be translated into multiple languages, any ad that needs to be translated into multiple, multiple languages. Okay. So will there, when will we get to the point to where we are dedicating more resources to what we clearly see that we're gonna need, regardless if there's a pandemic or not? And obviously I know that this is specific to the uses um, for FRF, but it speaks to a larger issue that I have been a broken record about since day one. So I just wanna make sure that if it's $25,000 now, I mean, it's going to be an ongoing need and we may need to look towards a long-term solution. Yes. Okay. Um, the, well, a couple of things. There's a lot of personnel in here and in every one of these instances when we talk about personnel, we're talking about positions that everybody understands that when this is over with, those positions go away. Yes, sir. So I, I want to, I mean, I'd almost like for the department heads to sign something that says they understand that if they've got a position that's created in this, that come December 31st, 2024, that position is gone. 
actually we treat them as grant positions so that when the funding ends that in but I would like to address that because quite frankly I had a concern about that also and so each one of those positions and each one of the programs they have KPIs that are assigned to to those those individuals they have to and the work has to be directly related to COVID and second of all they have to show that they're actually producing and that you know key performance indicator or kpi and i think we're going to evaluate that on an annual basis yes, not a four-year basis but on an annual basis and you'll see these coming back to you on an annual basis for funding good okay i think that's uh, the one other one i had in it chief it was it was the 20 bailiffs and are, is the intent there to take bailiffs in current courts and move them over to help you out in other areas and put these bailiffs in the courts because they're not they may not be certified jailers or I got you. the bailiffs that we're talking about there those employees are actually commissioned peace officers that are working for other jurisdictions that we're bringing in we're using them supplementally in our staff to free up some of our staff to to reassign in other words if we have a three position post um, we could use one of those bailiffs to assist there and then free up an experienced detention I mean detention a judicial officer to go work in a court okay so that's the purpose of that Okay, thank think you. It, think of it as a part-time engagement. Okay. Relief from. Yes. Any other discussion? Yeah, I just, here's, I'm kind of frustrated because I feel like we're having the same conversations over and over again. You all provide us a lot of information, right? And sometimes it's in context, sometimes it's out of context. And we've got to put it together. And I think that you all have been as helpful as you know to be based off of the direction that we've given you this week versus the next week versus the subsequent weeks so i don't know what more well maybe there's nothing else that that needs to be done um i guess here's my question is what do you all need from us to make sure that you're not sent in a direction that you're then asked to very little time after you spent so much time going in one direction to pivot and go another which with this whole pandemic thing we've, we've all learned how to pivot but it just seems like there's a way to simplify this so there's a little less confusion and we won't spend so much time repeating some of the stuff that we've talked about does that make sense and here's the answer to that we need a formal commissioner's court order to give us direction that we're seeking so and what we're doing today should help to clear things up absolutely moving forward. absolutely Okay. Anything else? That okay. this this will be sufficient All at right. this time. Thank you, ma'am. There's no other discussion. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank members, you all very much. Members of the court, if we can go to item number four, Mr. Merritt is going to be presenting this particular item. Good morning, court members. We have before you an, an agreement for approval between Tarrant County and MHMR of Tarrant County to operate the Tarrant County Mental Health Jail Diversion Center. I will move approval of the agreement, but I'd like to take note of a couple of things. Yes, sir. Number one is that the advisory committee that we have uh, considered since the inception of our talks about this is not in the interlocal agreement and I'm not sure that it needs to be in the agreement itself but I don't want to see it get swept aside because it's not in the agreement yes sir I, I would like a reconfirmation of the court that that is what we expect to happen as part of the operation of the mental health diversion center i'll second the motion and second that comment yes, from the standpoint that i think it's 
it's you know the interlocal agreements between MHR and Tarrant County, but that advisory committee is one that is going to be critical to the success because that means that everybody who is utilizing the facility, the police, the sheriff's office, whoever else, you know, Lauren King with the homeless folks, all of them will have the ability on a regular basis to uh, get together and to discuss those things that are going well and those things that are, you know, are in need of improvement. So, yes, sir. I, I agree with you, Commissioner, 100%. We intend to bring that, that committee back to court for approval within the next several weeks. Okay. The second thing is that this facility will present us with the ability to do various kinds of research. And one of the things that occurs to me is research on health disparities among the population that is served uh, at the center. And I would like to make sure that the ability to do that is fully included in our understanding of how we're gonna run this center. Yes, sir, in uh, number eight, actually, we have several performance measurement and regular reporting requirements on MHMR to assist in that endeavor. All right. Um, Go. Well, and I'm totally supportive of this. I'll ask that when we get the, the update in a few weeks from the advisory council, that also we're briefed on the law enforcement component of it. If there's anything that I've been asked the most about the status of this um, program, it's, well, what about the law enforcement component? And I think that the CDA had given some updates. This would have been months ago um, when it was still very much of a concept, but now that we have formalized it, just want to make sure that everyone's clear on the moving parts. And I'm sure Commissioner Brooks and the judge, because they've been so central to moving this forward, are up to date, but I'm not. So yes, I'd like to be Understood. Sure. Yeah. Any other discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Then finally, members of the court, on item number five, we're requesting that the court repeal the prohibition against outside burning in Tarrant County unincorporated areas. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, when do we want a break for lunch? We can break it any time. We'll take the auditor's office real quick and then break. Okay. Good one. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. We have several items that we're asking the court to consider today. The first is the approval and release of depository collateral and fourteen million one thousand dollars is for outlined. Approval. Move for approval. Sorry. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, next, we're going to ask the court to receive and file the Tarrant County financial statements for the months ended 2021 August. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we're next asking the court to receive and file the auditor's report related to the De Domestic Relations Office, and you have their response attached. Move for approval. Second. second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we're asking the court to receive and file the auditor's report and the review of the financial and system controls of Justice of the Peace Precinct 6 and their response. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And finally, we're asking the court to receive and file the auditor's report for the Tarrant County Sheriff's Commissary Operations for FY 2020, and you have their response attached. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 
Thank you, Mr. Stedman. So, Your Honor, if we would like to go into closed session at this time. Okay, then at this time we will uh, proceed to, we'll recess our open okay. discuss items exempted under section 551.071, 072, 074, 076, and 087, and 7, 7075. So, Your Honor, we could now go to uh, Human Resources. Move to receive and file a personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion to second to receive and file a personnel agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We have a few more items for the court. Uh, the next two items are requests uh, for extensions of project employment. Uh, the first request comes from archives. Uh, the request is for an additional year of project employment uh, for an employee who's working on their uh, digitizing project. If approved, um, this additional uh, leave would expire uh, November 5th of 2022. We're looking at, uh, if approved, uh, we're looking at a cost to the general fund of approximately $75,282 and some change. This is Roy's favorite. Yeah, Roy. I thought we were well, getting out of this business. I was hoping we wouldn't have to have this discussion today. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I know, I know. So, um, so there is not a, a full-time position currently, Commissioner, to move this in employee in two. Uh, I believe that that is uh, currently a discussion that's underway, but there is not currently a full-time position. Okay. Move for approval. Go ahead, figure she can be on the team. I'll be on the team. Uh, <laughs> I'll second that motion. Will. I'll second that motion for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. I hope y'all give Melissa a hard time when she's up here after me. Well, we'll that, see. Was, that was a little inside joke. Okay, okay. So the next item um, is a request for extension of project employment. As I mentioned earlier, this time from po uh, Probate Court 1, uh, Judge Ponder uh, has a temp who will have worked the two uh, years that the policy uh, allows plus an additional year uh, as of the 28th of this month. So the request that you have before you is just a few more weeks um, of an extension, specifically through November 12th. Uh, and what that will do is that will allow this individual to um, actually apply for a full-time position that was included in the 2022 budget. Okay. So Excellent. that'll just give them a little bit of time to work through that process. We're estimating a cost uh, to the general fund and probate contribution fund uh, of approximately $3,300. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. I would just note that Melissa came in, so that okay. she must have heard what she said. Okay. So. Yeah, she knows she's in trouble now. Get ready, Melissa. <laughs> No further discussion, please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. So uh, the next two items are TO changes. The, uh, the first uh, would affect both budget and risk uh, management. I'm sorry, budget risk management and the county administrator's office. So the request uh, is for a transfer as well as a funding change for three data analyst <coughs> positions that are currently in the county administrator's office the request is to transfer those to budget um, and also to move funding from ERAP funding to ARPA funding uh, if the court agrees then um, we'd be looking at an impact to ARPA funds of approximately one hundred ninety six thousand five hundred and fifty eight dollars and some change move for approval second we have a motion and a second ERAP, is that? That's, That's the Emergency, emergency Rental Assistance new county. Program. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 
me a long day, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got that look. <laughs> it's after lunch. <laughs> So Your mic wrap is, is the emergency rental assistance program. Which was paid for out of the CARES Act money? It was no. not, no. This one was paid out of a grant from, uh, from HUD. Remember we received? Oh, yeah. Treasury, I'm sorry, Treasury. And, um, and so, the, you know, why don't you explain? <laughs> you have to come up here then. They had county administrator just delegated. I am delegating certain All right. responsibilities. <laughs> it was so, so much our, easier for you to believe me. <laughs> I'll be quick. It's a new county. Our, our ERAP yeah. program is funded uh, through an e, the ERA grant through Treasury. Um, we originally came to court and asked for three data analyst positions um, for this program. Um, we are not going to use those positions because we identified other existing positions. So budget um, has a need for two data analysts, so we're asking to move two of the three approved for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program mm -hmm. to the Budget and Risk Man Management Office to work on ARPA. So they're not, we're not moving the rental program over to the budget, we're just no. moving the people over there and that other program's going to stay this, else. The other program is going to stay exactly the way it is now. We just don't need those positions for it. Good idea. Any other discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. So uh, I think we are on item five. This again is a TO change for the county courts of law, uh, number one, and the sheriff's office. So as described in your court communique, uh, the county uh, court of law is requesting an auxiliary court coordinator. Uh, they want this position to assist uh, all three courts with the backlog of forcible detainer appeals received from the JPs. Uh, this, the second position, the sheriff's office, is requesting an HR coordinator position uh, to help with COVID-related uh, leave requests. Uh, again, both would be ARPA funded if approved by the court at a cost of 161400 I'm sorry, $49 and some change. Move for approval. Second mm -hmm. with a question. Mm -hmm. Is County Court of Law number one the main court where these appeals on forcibles are heard? Um, it's my understanding that uh, this position will reside uh, in one, but will actually assist all three courts okay. with their uh, with the appeals. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. No further discussion. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And our sixth and final item, we're asking the court to approve a double fill as well as a waiver for. The 141st District Court. This is Judge uh, Chupp. Uh, he is a court coordinator who's retiring December 1st, and he's requesting the judge is requesting a waiver of 320 vacation hours, as well as a double fill from November 8th through the 30th, so the, that the appropriate cross training can occur. Uh, we're looking at a cost to the general fund, if approved, of about $16,178. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And Judge, if I could take just one minute to um, make an important announcement for all of our employees. We are at that time of the year. Uh, we're getting really close to benefits enrollment for next year. Uh, all of you should uh, have either gotten your packets or you should be receiving your packets soon. I received mine in the mail over the weekend. Just a couple of important reminders. Enrollment will begin October the, October the 28th and will run through November 10th. So it's going to be really important um, to make any elections that you'd like to make for next year. Remember, elections uh, don't roll over, specifically your flexible spending account uh, elections. If you want to put something in your own account, that does not roll from year to year. So 
whatever you want in place for yourself and your dependents in the way of benefits for next year. Uh, make sure that you get your elections in by the deadline again. That's uh, November 10th. Um, there will be a, a webinar that the Payroll and Benefits Service Center will be hosting on the 27th of this month at 10 o'clock. You do have to pre-register for the webinar. And so check your email. You should have an email from PBSC. So take action. Thank you. Melissa, they're going to be nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tina. We'll be making promises. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we have ten, 10 items for your consideration. The first item is an award recommendation for bid number 2021-113. This is our annual contract for lawn maintenance for facilities management, awarding to the primary, secondary, and alternate vendors listed in the court communique per unit price. Move for hmm. approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, the second item is an award recommendation regarding bid number 2021-117. This is for trench drain concrete repair uh, projects for facilities management, awarding to Gibson and Associates in the amount of $75,000. If approved, we're also requesting contract approval and acceptance of the payment bond. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The third item is an award recommendation regarding RFP number 2021-127. This is an in-building radio coverage enhancement for Mansfield Sub Courthouse and Lonel E. Cooper Community Justice Center for the Information Technology Department awarding to AWS Communications in the amount of $96,626. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The fourth item is also an award recommendation regarding bid number 2021-129, annual contract for HVAC, chiller maintenance, repair, and parts replacement for facilities management, awarding to the primary, secondary, and alternate vendors by section per unit price, per hourly rate, and markups for parts. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The fifth item is an award recommendation regarding RFP number 2021-146. This is an annual contract for counseling and education services for a veterans treatment program for criminal courts administration, awarding to the primary vendors listed in your court communique by section per contract terms. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The sixth item is an award recommendation regarding RFP number 2021-154. This is an annual contract for temporary personnel for event response data analysis for public health awarding to the primary vendors listed in the court communique per contract terms. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The seventh item is an award recommendation regarding bid number 2022-002. This is our annual contract for exterminating pest control and bee removal services for facilities management awarding to pest-proof exterminating services per unit price and per hourly rate. Move for approval. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The eighth item is, in a, rec is a recommendation to cancel an award to B&T Best Tow doing business as Milner Reckner, Wrecker regarding uh, bid number 2019-035. This is our annual contract for Wrecker services 
an award to the recommended next low bidders. Um, the, this vendor cannot comply with the one hour response time. So he asked um, if he could exercise his 30 day out clause. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Are we doing this without penalty? Uh, he asked to be removed because he didn't want to um, demolish his reputation with the county. He's been, he has done business with us before, but his letter stated that he um, just couldn't manage the one hour wait time and he didn't want to continue to have officers wait over an hour for his services. But um, because there were complaints and he didn't want his company tainted, he just asked if he could exercise his 30 day out clause. So there was a 30 day out clause in the contract? Yes, so. it is. Mm -hmm. He gave us a 30 day notice. Well, if there's the out clause, then I, that might, I mean, that would be the reason that I would. Is it due, due to up. traffic concerns? Yep. That was the reason why he had a hard time responding within an hour. All right. Uh -huh. Whatever. Any further discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The ninth item is a recommendation to cancel award to Victory Supply uh, regarding bid number 2021-006. This is our annual contract for inmate hygiene supplies for the Sheriff's Office and Juvenile Services, and we're recommending awarding to the next low bidders per unit price. Uh, this contract does expire in 30 days. Uh, we've previously come, come to you within the last few months recommending other, other, other vendors that were having trouble with product um, with, with some of the, um, the inmate supplies that comes from overseas. Um, so Do you mind raising the mic, Sam? I can't hear very well. Sure. Oh, that's better. Thank you. And so our contract does not allow for price increases, so we have been allowing vendors to um, utilize the 30-day out clause for this particular contract. Mm -hmm. So these are supply chain issues? This, this one is, yes. Move but we have gone back out to bid and we'll, we'll be awarding a new contract next month. Second. We have a motion and a second. So on any of these other ones, are we basically letting them out and then I, just, we, I guess we just rebid it and we hopefully we can rebid it in that 30 days? Yeah, we've known about this issue with the inmate hygiene supplies for the last few months. So we, we do have secondary and alternate awards. So we've just moved on to the secondary and alternates. Uh, they were able to hold their prices because they had room to allow for, for increases. Okay. But in the future, we, we, most of the time we're just rebidding. Okay. Any further discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And the tenth and last item is a resend of court order number 136504 for award recommendation regarding bid number 2021-138. This is our annual contract for trash removal services. After the award was made, the buyer brought to my attention that the bid tab um, had a weekly charge and it should have been monthly. Yeah. The spreadsheet was incorrect, so we made that correction to monthly. It read week weekly. Okay, so what are we going to do here? We're going to rescind this contract, and we're rescinding the last court. We we bought this to court the last uh, last Tuesday we met in September. And that was under court order number 136504. So we're rescinding that one and asking for your approval of the correct, 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 the correct okay. contract. Okay. Yes. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, court members, are there any appointments today? I have. I, 
I need to appoint Russell Laughlin to the Northern Trinity Groundwater Conservation District for another term ending 12-31-2023. Second. I move. Or did you? Hey, let me add one to that motion, please. Please. Uh, I would like to add uh, Wayne Merritt to the NTGCD board. Reappointment. Second accepts the addition. Hmm? The second accepts the addition. I don't know about this guy. He's got a... What board is that? He's got a questionable son. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is Chandler's father, and it's for the water. Yeah, but you got water rid of it, so you can't talk about him anymore. I guess that's right. Uh, there's no further discussion. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, you have before you the claims, including the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. second. We have a motion to second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, Hot dog, we got one briefing item left. Yes. If we can go to the briefing item now. We're going to go into item 11D. Going to, this is concerns, I'm sorry, 11C. This concerns the IEM interim report. Ms. Camarena is here to address the court this time. Kristen, before you uh, address the court on this, would you introduce some of our new employees? I will. At this time? So we'd like to introduce to you a few employees in the administrator's office who uh, will be working on ARPA and FRF yes, with sir. us. So mm -hmm. you'll become uh, very familiar with them as you uh, see them in the courtroom and, and working on uh, programs and projects with us. So I'll ask them to go ahead and stand. Uh, Jason, go ahead and stand too so they can put a name with a face. Uh, so Jason, Jason Adams has been with us for a while now and you receive a report from him weekly on Tuesday mornings. Um, he, how long have we been with it? Six months, nine months? I can't remember. Since uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Deshaun Johnson uh, is a new data analyst in our office. Um, and Dr. Duchess Humphrey is our program evaluation specialist. So they'll really be into the weeds of the programs uh, as we begin to roll things out under ARPA. Great. And we'd like welcome. to welcome them too. Okay. Now, Deshaun is not one of the ones you just shipped to budget. No, those those positions were vacant. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, we're not we're not giving these these two away. <laughs> okay, um, and so now to our briefing item. Um, so you've each received a digital copy of the uh, interim report that IEM has provided to us. Um, you also have a print copy there with you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson will get a bound copy to you sometime this week. I don't have one. Uh, it's on your desk, sir. We can. Okay. Okay, GK's got one Go for you. This. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So this okay. is the same thing that's in the red folder, or? Yes. No. no this is the one that we emailed to them. And so yes. Is, is the slide deck is in the, what's in the red folder. The slide deck is in the red folder, yes. So IEM is here to present findings that are contained in that report. <laughs> Yeah. The, it, it looks like what's in your red folder are the slides that they will be presenting today. Okay. Yes. Uh, so with us are Katie McCoy, Angel Roebuck, and Meg Amento. You all met them during our consultant introduction meetings uh, in August. Katie will be presenting today, uh, and Meg is going to be in the back doing some inter interactive mapping for you. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask Katie to come up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me back. Um, so as Kristen mentioned, I'm here to present the findings for the, the interim report. Um, so as we wrap up phase one, we are on the left-hand side, the end for the present the action plan to the court for consideration. Um, moving forward, we will be doing those, uh, uh, sorry, focus group roundtables. We'll also be including some um, community representation as part of those, and then doing some surveys for the community as a whole um, through the months of October through, this, through December to compile all that and do our final report and list of recommendations by the end of January. So 
Um, this is just a slide that shows what the front, of the front cover of the interim report is. Um, but we, uh, over the last six weeks, we've done about 40 interviews. We've talked to over 120 stakeholders, which is pretty substantial in six weeks. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see all of the organizations that we talked to one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll give you guys a second to read through that, because that's a lot. And I don't know if I could read it from here anyway. Um, so moving forward, um, we do want to continue to have that equity approach. So we're going to use data-driven priorities. And when we talk about data-driven, um, I'll show you in a couple of slides what that's going to look like for us and the, the information that we've compiled. Um, we also want to continue to do community engagement with um, the county at large and then evaluating the benefits versus the barriers. So what barriers do we need to re remove to make sure everyone gets the most benefit out of the recommendations that we're um, addressing. Um, so just a quick highlight for the Tarrant County profile, and this is kind of in order of what that report looks like. Um, you'll see in 2010, um, it was about a 67, 33% split, and then we are now a minority majority um, county. But this is really the breakdown of what uh, that looks like based off race and ethnicity. So um, we went from, sorry, did you have a question? It's okay. Um, so in, uh, for 2020, um, on the white side where it says 49%, about 29% is Hispanic or part of that two or more races. Um, so we also developed an interactive map for um, the county to use, where we've compiled a list of um, a list of data points. So it really includes the top quintile of the community resiliency estimates, as well as the social vulnerability indices, um, the qualified census tracts, population density, median income, vaccination percentages. So we're using some data that we pulled from the county health department um, to include first dose and fully vaccinated individuals, race and ethnicity, as well as languages spoken. Um, so I believe Meg can hear me in the back, and she's gonna switch to um, the uh, actual map. So this is a website that you guys will have a link to as well on the electronic copy, but we'll make sure we get you the link as a standalone as well. Um, so when you first click into the map, it'll show you the overlay of the SVIs, the CREs, and the qualified census tracts. Uh-oh. I think she, uh, I think she was trying to refresh it, and it maybe didn't work for us. Yeah, I tried to access it straight from the electronic presentation. It's not working either. It didn't work for you either? No. Okay. I know we had an issue earlier with maybe the browser is not working and not being a supported browser, but we'll find a way to work around that for y'all. Oh, wait. Yay. Okay. Wait, it popped up. Okay. It worked in Firefox, but not um, not one Edge of the other or ones. yeah, okay. yeah. Let's see. So, would you like to just simply come back to that piece? Yeah, we can come back to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to the next piece, um, really the impacts of the pandemic. So I do want to preface this by saying uh -oh, um, that the data that we're going to present for the pre-pandemic uh, picture that we're painting will not have side-by-side -side comparisons for post-pandemic or currently, um, just because that data is currently being aggregated and may not be available to us. So you're going to see some data on the left-hand side that may not have a direct correlation on the right-hand side. Um, but the areas that we wanted to focus on were for health and wellness, food insecurity, housing and homelessness, care of our aging population and people with disabilities, quality child care and out of school care. I think they got it to work. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to this. Um, so 
When you open it, it'll show you the overlay of the SVIs and the CREs. So I believe the SVIs are in blue, the CREs are in red, and then the yellow is an overlay of where both of those intersect. And then the green outlines are going to be your qualified census tracts. And Meg, if you can scroll in a little bit, zoom in for us a bit. There we go. On the left-hand side, uh-oh, okay, it's struggling. That's fine, we'll come back to it. Um, local businesses, workforce, and then community violence, and that's also going to include domestic, child, domestic and child abuse, as well as sexual violence. Uh, I'm not sure if the um, AV team can help me advance the slide. The clicker doesn't seem to be working. Thank you. Um, so on. For health and wellness pre-pandemic, we had about 20% of the county residents who were reporting being in poor or fair health. We also had about 22% of adults who were uninsured for the county. Uh, about 30% of the county was obese. And then 3.9 poor mental health days were being reported per month based off of this survey. And I believe this came from either GPS or Texas Health Resources. 12% um, of adults experienced frequent mental distress. Um, which is about more than 14 days per month. And then we have one mental health provider for every 820 individuals, um, where the national average is about, is about one to 290. So we're in a pretty um, dire state as far as mental health providers. On the right-hand side, you'll see some of the impacts that we've seen and that, or that we've heard anecdotally over the last six weeks from the community members who we've spoken to. So we're seeing a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 frequency and severity among communities of color. Um, we're also seeing a 50% increase for drug overdoses, for death, um, suicide becoming the leading cause of trauma deaths in the last 18 months, and then an increased need for mental and behavioral health services. Um, I don't think any of this ha is any surprise for those of us in the county, um, but just some information to compare pre-COVID and then currently. We can go to the next slide. I'm still having a difficult time advancing on my own. You're using the mic. Yeah. I don't know if they clicked off of it. Okay. So, so go ahead and advance the next slide, please. So may I ask a question while we're so one of the things that, that I don't see on here is access to uh, health care. <laughs> is that going to be an issue that we talk about today? Um, we can, I don't believe it's included in this presentation, but that's definitely something we'd like to continue to have a conversation about. You might, you might notice that there was an article in the newspaper two days ago about uh, the lack of, of individuals maintaining their appointments for cancer screening and the severity of, of what happens when you let cancer linger without treatment. And so I think, I, I believe that eventually we're going to want to be talking about that also. Now I understand that there are some interventions in the works that we should be hearing about shortly. Yes. Um, so moving on to food insecurity, um, pre-pandemic, we had about 25% of Tarrant County residents with limited access to grocery stores. Um, we had 15% of the county who were experienced food insecurity and about 18% of children who were experiencing the same with the overall average nationwide being a little less than 11%. Um, so as far as the impacts from COVID-19, we saw increased food insecurity for older adults, and then our Tarrant Area Food Bank, as well as Meals on Wheels, saw a significant increase.
Um, one of the things that's a positive that's come out of COVID, but due to increased federal support, we've actually seen a decrease of about 30% in homelessness for the county, which is huge. Um, but we do still have a pretty significant lack of housing and rental inventory, um, and then lack of non-acute housing post-COVID uh, for, for the aging population. It's also a very competitive um, home buyer market, and we have some insufficient and inaccessible legal support for those facing eviction. So before we move forward, may we stand down for about five minutes? We need to reboot our system so we can get this slide program. Is that because IT decided they were going to do a software change in the middle of the day? No, sir. <laughs> Just wondering, because about two or three times I've had to click the data to tell it, don't you dare close me down right now. So you... Yes, we can stand down for five minutes. Thank, thank you. Okay. Okay, we're ready to proceed. Apologies for that. Good luck. Thank Not you. your fault, Katie. <laughs> Not your fault at all. I, I told Kristen, I said, I used to work government, so I understand the IT challenges. <laughs> this is something that's easily overcome, so. Yes. Um, so going on to the next focus area for care for aging adults and people with disabilities. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had about 11% of the county population that was over the age of 65. And then 33% of the residents who were 65 plus um, who also had a disability. So that's um, a pretty significant portion of our population. And then during COVID, what we really saw was that increased isolation, depression, and associated cognitive decline of aging adults. We also saw higher risk of injury for those living alone. Um, we saw increased symptoms from chronic diseases in older adults, uh, caregiver staff shortages, so not just caregivers, but also people who worked in nursing homes who changed the linens, who did the janitorial piece of it too. We saw um, significant decline in those numbers. And then we, but we also have a projected 25% growth with the county for population over the age of 65 um, in the next few years. Uh, the next focus area is quality childcare and out-of-school care. Um, so prior to the pandemic, uh, about one in 10 Texas children under the age of five with working parents live in a childcare desert. That's uh, pretty significant. And then we see an average cost of 7,500 and 9,500 a year for full-time childcare just within Tarrant County. Um, some of the impacts from COVID-19 were the academic delays compounded by social emotional delays uh, for children, and that was due to either um, online learning for lack of um, socialization with kids their own age, um, but then we also saw a lack of avail availability and access to high quality child care and youth services. So that already desolate area um, <coughs> experienced even more lack of availability. We saw high turnover, low pay, and a need for training and certifications for providers, and then long wait lists for after school care. Um, our next focus area was local businesses. So pre-pandemic, we had a, a little over 43,000 43, establishments um, and then about 173,000 total firms. So um, a little over 66,000 women owned, 71,000 minority owned, and then uh, 16,000 veteran owned. Uh, impacts from COVID, this is no surprise, lost revenue, small business closures, significant job losses, and disproportionate impact on women and minority owned businesses. And then for workforce, uh, prior to the pandemic, 74, almost 75% of the employees in Tarrant County worked for a private company. Uh, not quite 3% were self-employed, a little over 5.5% were private not-for-profit and salary workers. Um, by August 2019, we had a 3.4% unemployment rate, which is relatively low. Um, because of COVID, we saw a six, almost a 6.5% unemployment rate in August of last year, and that's gone down to 4.9% unemployment as of August of this year. Um, in June 2020, we had a record 33% of U.S. employees who were working remotely. And then that's Peter. That's gone down a little bit to about 22% as of last September. And it stayed pretty consistent since then. 
We also saw an increased need for job training and job placement, and then challenges and skills matching between workers who are available to work and then the available jobs that, that are out there. And then we also saw an increase in competitive wages um, due to the lack of available of people available to work. <clears throat> Moving to community violence, um, pre-pandemic, one in three women in Tarrant County um, will experience domestic violence at some point in their lifetime compared to the nav national average of one in four. Um, eight Tarrant County women were murdered by their current or former intimate partner in 2019. Uh, almost 14,000 family violence incidents occurred in 2017 in Tarrant County. And then we had 132 homicides in 2019, of which 95 were gun violence. Um, from COVID, uh, that number for intimate partner murders almost doubled, or more than doubled, I'm sorry, was 17 during 2020. We saw an increase in homicides, specifically gun violence. Um, we saw a 25% increase for um, the need for forensic rape exam accompaniments uh, for 80, going up to 89 a month. I believe the, the former number was 71 a month. Uh, we saw a 15% increase in child forensic interviews that were being conducted, a significant increase in children witnessing violent crimes, a 26% increase in response to severe child physical abuse, and then shortage of staff, including caseworkers and volunteers, to help support those efforts. So, with all of that information, our initial recommendations. These are our near-term recommendations and long-term priorities, and these will be aligned to those four focus areas that the county identified prior to us coming on. So just an overview, this is just the, the main slide with all the four focus areas and then the goals associated. So for prepare for the future for near-term recommendations, we have expand Tarrant County staffing capacity, evaluate use of current Tarrant County space, review county response for, to COVID-19 for lessons learned and best practices, and then improve air quality in Tarrant County facilities. For long-term prioritization, we're um, engaging with community-based organizations supporting underserved populations, develop a community affairs program to support equitable messaging of available programs, and then streamline the Tarrant County's um, application processes to improve accessibility to services. So that's it for Prepare for the Future. For improved public health and wellness for near-term recommendations, we're recommending a mental health awareness and early intervention program for school-aged children, enhancing preventative cancer screening programs within targeted communities, restore the assisted outpatient treatment program, uh, support service navigation programs for at-risk families with children aged zero to 18, expand mobile and pop-up vaccine clinics in underserved communities, and support health fairs within targeted communities and then establish a personal protective equipment program. Long-term priorities for improved public health and wellness will focus on collaboration with law enforcement to meet the mental health need for those with behavioral health issues, calling emergency services and connect them with the available resources that they'll need. Um, and then develop a mental health diversion center to accommodate the needs of individuals needing mental health assistance in place of incarceration. For revitalize the economy, near-term recommendations, direct grants to businesses and nonprofits within affected sectors and or located in qualified census tracts, expand technical assistance and entrepreneurship training to women and minority-owned businesses, as well as historically utilized uh, businesses, underutilized businesses, I'm sorry, and then expand family and support programs to those with dependents with disabilities. For long-term priorities under Revitalize the Economy, uh, partner with college and workforce readiness programs to expand preparation efforts for Tarrant County youth, expand equitable access to high quality early learning and care for all Tarrant County families, support um, incubators and accelerator programs to support innovation, 
and then encourage creation of, of apprenticeship programs for graduates of technical training schools. Under strengthen the community, for near-term recommendations, we're recommending direct programs to expand evidence-based abuse and violence prevention programs, direct grants to nonprofit organizations providing essential services and support to low-income aging citizens, direct grants to expand food distribution, continue to manage the emergency rental assistance program, and then provide financial assistance and legal support to people facing, facing eviction or homelessness. And then finally, the long-term priorities for strengthen the community is to direct funding to support building and or renovation of additional units to house people experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness and qualified census tracts, and then expand programs to increase financial literacy and promote financial stability. Any questions or comments on our recommendations? I think you've done a What's good that? job. Thank you, sir. Um, I hope we met your expectations. You're good, man. Okay. I agree. I do have a few questions, though. Um, one is, some of the, the data points that you provided, they're sourced, but most of them aren't. So can you, I don't know, hopefully this is all footnoted somewhere. I'd love to just, as I'm sharing it, I want to make sure that I'm attributing it correctly and also will want to do some more research on my own. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. So I forgot to mention, um, in the back of the actual printed document that you okay. have, there um, are a couple of appendices. So the first appendices is going to be um, the full recommendations list. So okay. it's going to tie each of the recommendations I just went through to a specific uh, focus area and goal. It's also okay. going to um, crosswalk it with any available program that's currently in Tarrant County that we found. Okay. And then additional funding sources. Okay. Um, one of the other appendices is going to be the um, resource assessment. So all of the other grant programs that are out there under ARPA, not just FRF. <laughs> Um, and then other things that include HUD and a number of other financial resources that are available for the county level. Okay. Um, there's also a reference portion of this that has all of the sources that we used. Perfect, okay, okay. great. Well, and I'm really glad to see all the maps that are in here specifically about languages spoken. And we had this conversation in the context of the redistricting mm -hmm. is, is really problematic if people can't even see themselves on a map. So as far down as we need to drill to make those numbers apparent on a map, I want us to do that like in every instance um, so that people are seen. Yeah, that was one of the things that I had hoped we would have been able to do today with the map because you can see multiple layers. Um, the maps in the, in the back are great. They're all brightly colored and you can see um, specific layouts, but being able to layer those on top of each other to really dig down into what you're looking for, um, I think would be really beneficial. So, yeah. yeah. Um, off the top of your head, when we you were referencing um, access to food, um, what's the current definition of a grocery store? Because that changes, and that's a big difference. That can make a big difference. That is a really good question. Okay. I do not have that off the top okay. of my head, um, but we can go back and pull that for you. Okay. Um, and then I know that we had all provided lists of community organizations, community leaders that we wanted for you all to reach out to. And obviously you had to, you know, kind of triage mm -hmm. that list and see what was appropriate to get us to this point and moving forward. But so what's the expectation that we should give to the people who were on those lists but have not yet been contacted? Well, we're in the process of reaching out to them for okay. community roundtables. Okay. So if they're either going to be part of our equity and inclusion group um, to give us or validate some of the approaches that we're going to be taking um, or give their input, they'll be, re they'll be contacted for that or they'll be included as part of a specific um, focus area. So we'll take, we're going to take a couple of these and dig down into um, to get a little bit more information that we may not have yet. Yeah. I will add, I mean, all of this information is good and none of it necessarily surprised me. I don't know if that's good or bad, right? Yeah. Especially some of these statistics are pretty, uh, pretty sobering. But when we talk about the access to mental health specifically for our youth and young adults, obviously just 
two weeks ago, we suffered a, the tragedy at Timberview. I have been on the phone, I don't, can't even say how many conversations I've had and you know, been a part of virtual events and where the community has just talked about their sadness and their fear and their grief and you know, the trauma. Um, so, you know, hopefully there won't be another such tragedy, but obviously the last year and a half has showed us that our community has just gone through so much. So yeah. I just want to impress upon us all like how important it is specifically that we are caring for uh, the children in our community. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're now about halfway through phase two. We're going to start, um, we're focusing, I believe, the first week of November for the community roundtables. We're reaching out to people this week to invite them to those. Um, and we're, we've identified a few groups that who we'd like to speak at those and kind of give, um, some of them have presented here, but then some others have not. Um, and then we'll be able to compile that information on top of what we've already done, as well as the surveys that we'll submit um, out into the community, um, hopefully with the support of all of you, uh, to help distribute that and get a little bit more information from the community at large. Um, so our next steps, we're going to continue that outreach and engagement through the roundtables and surveys. Uh, continue focusing on equity, so really making sure that we're um, putting those who with the greatest need as the at the forefront of this project. Um, continuing that regional collaboration. Um, one of the things that I've been very impressed with, and I think my colleagues would say the same thing, is that every person we've talked to has said we're, we just want to support each other and make sure that this is the best option for the entire county. There hasn't been a lot of ego involved in it, which is really great. Um, and then continue that strategy development in partnership with the county administration's office. So making sure that we're, we're producing strategies or recommendations that fit appropriately for Tarrant County. Um, so I did want to mention something about the interactive roundtables. Um, we use a we use a platform called Mentimeter. Um, it's probably the only time that we encourage people to take their cell phones out whenever we're in a, we're in a meeting. So, um, Commissioner Allen, I think you saw a little bit of that with the Latino Leaders Group that we we talked to. So this is actually a result of one of their questions. So they'll be given a website and a unique code for that particular roundtable. We'll ask them a series of questions, and it'll be anything from, on a scale of one to five, um, an open-ended question so they can put in a couple of words that would best describe their response, or um, a list of um, items that they can click off that'll go into a database. So this is just a screenshot of what that looks like for us on the back end. Is it still called a Wordle? Is that what this is? I'm sorry? A Wordle? Is it still called a Wordle? I or think we call it a Word Cloud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for updating <laughs> The Wordle is a little bit more fun to say. Exactly. Um, it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that is all I have today. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll open it up for any questions from us. In the course of your conversations and your interviews, especially with other recipients of this money, you know, we've talked about it in terms of maybe setting some countywide priorities with other entities putting money in a pot and then distributing it. We've talked about, you know, I mentioned tithing and doing things along that lines. Has anyone else expressed any interest whatsoever in doing something along that lines? So we are also planning to do a um, an elected roundtable in December with the cities within the county. And that is going to be part of that conversation. So um, no explicit uh, interest has been expressed so far, but that's something that we're keeping as part of the conversation as well. I still hope that that's one of the things that we might be able to do. Because I think the things that you've mentioned, homelessness, <coughs> mental health, things along that lines, especially education, child care, uh, quality child care, after school programs are things that are going to help our kids catch up on the education standpoint as well as with the health and some of those kind of things. And instead of each one of us trying to do our thing in those areas, 
I hope that we could pool some funds, pick the partner that could best, you know, execute mm -hmm. those priorities and, and move forward with that. Okay. Any, Any other questions, comments at this point in time? Thank you all so Thank much. You, Katie. Thank you. So you've heard the next steps for IEM. I'm just going to briefly try to tie that into our internal processes um, and provide some next steps from staff. Um, so we will, uh, on the long-term program development, we'll continue to coordinate with IEM for phase two of their assessment and, of course, work with them to keep the court updated on that. Um, but for the near-term recommendations, we'll go back and develop a program outline that corresponds with the recommendations you've heard today. So what that means is reaching out to those stakeholders, um, requesting solutions to meet the needs that have been identified, uh, and formulating program recommendations um, that tie back to our focus areas and providing an overview of how the, what the fiscal impact might be to our FRF fund to implement some of the, the programs to meet the needs you've heard today. Uh, so that's a lot of words to say that in, in the next couple of weeks we'll be coming back with some, some uh, dollar amounts and some requests for action to move forward on some of these items. Any questions? Questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, it's been a uh, day. And thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask that we, that we adjourn in honor of Colin Powell? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, if that's okay, then we will do that. And with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>